Thank you everyone for tuning in to yet another episode in which I talk about issues related to public transport. Uh, now, I've been in a New York role recently. Well, not last week when it was the webinar about Sweden, uh, but in previous weeks, um, with my usual apologies to Warners. And this is still going to be a New York um, focused stream, and we're going to talk about the Interborough Express or IBX. Uh, now, this is something that I want to say do for a living, by which I mean what I do for a living is the transit cost project. Um, we are about to wrap up, and uh, so this is the Sweden case where we just webinared. Um, we're about to wrap up all of the cases and the synthesis of all of them combined. So what we're going to do is we're transitioning to a bunch of other things, which are high-speed rail, but also something very specific to IBX. Uh, so um, here are some preliminary things about IBX. Um, so first of all, I'm going to tell you what this is, what IBX is, what the history is, and then what's currently going on with it. So let's start with the situation in the 1990s, which is, I believe, when the idea was first um, was first mooted as something that was called Triborough RX. Uh, it was a proposal in the 90s, Triborough RX, by uh, the RPA, Regional Plan Association. Um, it's a local... Uh, it's a local think tank it's got, um, dedicated to uh, regional planning um, and urbanism and transport issues. And what they noticed, so here on Google Earth, I'm going to just move myself. Oh, hi, Rob. Uh, and I'm going to just move myself to the slide that does not conflict with Google Earth as much. Um, so... This is a map, so black here, so on this map, it shows all the railway lines in black, and then subway lines are depicted if they are um, above ground or in a trench, not if they're underground. So this is where you're seeing this kind of orphan line. This is the F train where it is in a legacy viaduct, and then when it uses a subway from the 30s, um, it kind of disappears um, the way it's currently depicted. Uh, and... Um, but you can see that there's this black line that functions as an orbital um, from the middle of Brooklyn and Queens. And then it feeds into Hellgate Bridge, um, also used by uh, Amtrak to get from New York to Boston. Uh, and then beyond, um, there's no clear destination in the Bronx. However, what they found in the night, when they realized in the 90s, was that a destination did actually exist. The destination was Yankee Stadium here. So the idea was um, to somehow build a curve, and you can see remnants of that right of way around here, um, called St. Mary's Tunnel um, around here, and uh, use that existing infrastructure, it would get up until uh, Melrose, the um, Metro North station that is not very heavily used, um, but it exists and there is some neighborhood job activity around here um, called the Hub. And then short subway, short Greenfield subway gets you to Yankee Stadium, which is a uh, um, a transfer station between the four train, sorry, not the four train, is the four train and the B and D trains, and is the busiest subway station in the Bronx. So the idea, so it was called Triboro, because three boroughs: Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx. And uh, it was called Triboro RX because it was planned in the 1990s by the RPA as part of their uh, regional. Uh, sorry, not the third regional plan. The first was in the, um, the first would have been 20s and 30s. The second, I think, 60s. The third was in the 90s. Um, and it uh, heavily centered Second Avenue Subway, which was being um, debated at the time and would soon be uh, funded and then designed and then built, or at least one quarter of it would be built. Um, 
And so they had the, uh, um, this kind of grandiose RX or regional express system that included um, a four track second avenue subway with a lot of branches to a lot of places. Um, uh, an express line from JFK to Lower Manhattan. Uh, I don't remember if it made the plan, but I know that Yonah Framark, who um, entered for them, maybe not then. I, I, I don't think Yonah Framark is that old. I think he's only a few years older than me. Maybe he entered for them in the uh, mid 2000s, but he did uh, propose a through running system uh, that um, I. It was never very well advertised. Again, I don't remember if it was part of the official RX plan. Um, but um, but he sent me this when I started um, uh, telling him about the running and said, oh yeah, I'd already thought about um, about this as part of RPA. So Triborough RX is Triborough is part of the regional express system. This does not mean Triborough is an express line, quite to the contrary, it was planned. So um, let me see if I can find uh, this on Michael Fruman's website. So the person who was doing the work on this um, was, I think at the time, an intern named uh, Michael Fruman, uh, who uh, in the mid 2000s put this on his website. Fruman, uh, I think it was Fruman.net. I think the website is gone, but you can find bits of it. This is Street's blog from 2007. Uh, I, as, as I said, I think the blog is gone. Um, you may be able to find a, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's not going to be there. It's going to be on the, um, archive. Um, so as I said, the, the line in Brooklyn and then Queens and then Hellgate and then these tunnels and then, uh, some disused short green field going up to Yankee stadium. Um, you may be able to tease out the um, stations. The explicit plan was a station every half mile. Uh, and um, the, and uh, this is where new transit riders would originate. So you might notice that it's a lot of them are near the line. They would use the line, but a lot of them are quite far from the line uh, because their trips would involve the line to other places. For example, maybe between... Um, so maybe between Jamaica um, and then you use the line to Jackson Heights and then to the Bronx or the other way. Um, or East New York to Flushing or, or anything like that. So um, so th so it's an orbital that's designed explicitly around transfers to other destinations. Now, New York already has an orbital subway line. It is called the G-Train. Uh, it connects Long Island City, Court Square, um, along um, um, uh, along what is it, Manhattan, and then Manhattan Avenue, not Manhattan the Borough, uh, and Lafayette to downtown Brooklyn, and then it has a tail going towards South Brooklyn to uh, I think at this point Church Avenue from here, uh, and. Um, it is not a popular line at all. Uh, it is infrequent. Um, I, I actually took it a bunch when I was last in New York in March uh, because Marin, uh, because I would go to the office at Marin, which is in downtown Brooklyn, and my hotel was in Long Island City. So the G was my commute for a couple of weeks. And the G came every 12 minutes. Um, and I was commuting... No, I, I, I think it was even maybe every eight minutes or something at rush hour. It was already 12 minutes on the shoulders of rush hour, let's say 9.30 in the morning. Um, and the trains were short. Um, most trains in New York are eight or ten cars long. Uh, the G runs half trains of, uh, uh, I forget whether four or five cars. And so the... Uh, so it's a low ridership line. Now the G does connect the two most important off Manhattan and um, different destinations, which are Long Island City and um, downtown Brooklyn, but it fails in that it does not have good transfers to the other lines. So let me find you New York City subway map. Uh, and, then, and let's just do the official one, um, not crayon. The crayon. So I like crayoning on um, accurate maps not schematics 
to show people where the lines exactly go. Now, this is in the New York map, which is, um, by typical standards, geographically accurate. It's not as schematic as, let's say, the London Underground map. Um, but it does have schematic features, like, for example, Manhattan is a lot thicker than it should be. Manhattan is by far the smallest New York City borough geographically, and here it's shown as about the same size as the Bronx. Um, so the G, okay, so it's Church Avenue, just outside downtown Brooklyn, this is, um, I think this is already Park Slope. Yeah, there's a transfer. Um, and then you can see how in downtown Brooklyn, yeah, it runs with the F, then transfers to the AC, and then it crosses the most significant collection of lines through downtown Brooklyn without a transfer. This is because the history of the system is that the numbered lines, Brooklyn 4, 5, Brooklyn 3, they were built um, as part of the first subway, 1904, or well, one of them was, the others were extensions. Um, the lettered lines from J onward, um, so these are mostly the trunks colored yellow, NQRW, brown, JZ at this point, M, and gray for L. They were built together with the extensions of the first subway, so this and this. They were built in the 1910s and 20s. Um, they were part of a system called the BMT. The numbered lines were IRT, two different private companies operating the subway by contract. And then the lines that are currently A, B, C, D, E, F, G were built um, by the city in the 20s and 30s. Something called the I, it's something that's called the independent subway system um, was later retroactively initialized to IND. Um, it's not a, IND is not an acronym, it's just an abbreviation. But IRT, BMT, IND, and the IND, and the, and the IND was built explicitly to compete with the private systems and not to complement them in any way. So, for example, Sixth Avenue line, you can see it's orange, it's BDFM. Uh, that's a, that is an IND line built very close to the BMT line, the uh, Broadway line, uh, and QRW as competition. Uh, and uh, so the lines, so they just didn't care about intersecting these lines with transfers. So G here runs alongside the F, connects with the AC, but misses all of the um, IRT and BMT connections. Um, if you're wondering how come there's a D and a B here and it doesn't mean, uh, this connection is called Christy Street Connection. It is uh, from the 60s, so, uh, and, and this same. So from here, toward Brooklyn and from here toward Brooklyn, orange colored lines run um, as BMT lines. Um, the F is where the original, uh, and the AC is where the, um, these are where the, I, the original ND run to Brooklyn. So um, it misses this transfer, it misses this transfer with the JZ. It does make the transfer with the L, and then the transfers um, in Long Island City are not great. Court Square, I believe, only opened as a transfer. Um, I don't remember, maybe 10 or 12 years ago. Um, the New York of the mid-2000s had, um, I, I don't think the G had the transfer, had a transfer to these, or if it was, it was an out-of-system transfer. It still is a transfer with a lot of walking. Uh, and, the, and, and then you can see there's no transfer to Queens or Plaza. Um, there used to be a transfer to Queens Plaza, but it got called back over time. Uh, and so the um, point of Triborough is instead of connecting the most important destinations, it's going to connect secondary destinations like uh, Brooklyn College here, um, one of the busiest subway stations in Brooklyn. Uh, but it's not downtown Brooklyn. Downtown Brooklyn is not, does not uh, furnish any very busy subway station because essentially there are a lot of different downtown Brooklyn stops. Uh, but um, uh, so, so this is why this can be one of the busiest in Brooklyn. Um, likewise, the second busiest in Queens, Jackson Heights, is the transfer between the seven and the E F uh, M R. Uh, it's this point where they connect. Uh, this is the second busiest Queen station. The busiest being Flushing, and uh, and you can see that the line passes kind of near it. Now, it's going to be a long transfer. Uh, 
we can count it on, we, we can measure the, the line length, let's say along Roosevelt or along the Savan. It's just along the line, 200 something meters of walking. Bear in mind, the transfer between 7th and 6th avenues, and or between 7th and 8th, um, is longer. So people do make this transfer between 6th and 7th, um, and and here between 7th and 8th. These are longer transfers. They're pretty inconvenient, but people make them. Um, there are worse transfers out there. Uh, yeah, the G, so, yeah, so the G, so yeah, so the slightly more detailed history of the G is that the G did not run the way that it currently runs when it first opened. Um, when the Queens Boulevard line opened in the 30s, the E and F trains ran the Express, which they still do. Um, they ran up to here. The uh, This addition to um, Jamaica Station, Jamaica Center is much later. I think it's, I think this opened 80s. Uh, and then the local trains, the ones that are currently MR, they were the G train. So the idea was that to get to Manhattan, you use the express. To travel internally or to Brooklyn, you use the local G. Um, and then you can transfer at Queens Plaza. The problem is people want to go to Manhattan, not to um, downtown Brooklyn. So essentially everyone heading inbound um, in the morning on the G would just transfer to the F. If they started here, they would transfer here. If they started here, they would transfer to Queens Plaza. Um, and there were only two tracks the EM tunnel. Uh, the 7 was the IRT tunnel, the NRW, what's now the NRW, going to Astoria, was the um, BMT tunnel. So what they did is they opened this connection, which is called 11th Street Connection, and they, so they're running, the, so they run the R as a second local train uh, to fire cells in addition to the G um, to provide more direct Manhattan service. Um, and also make the system a lot more complex. It was the first time there was a track connection between the IND and the BMT. Um, the other thing I mentioned, Crisis Street, um, that was later. This is 60s, I believe 11th, 60s, 50s. Um, and uh, then they realized people still needed more Manhattan service. So, uh, I, so, so what they did is they started building this line, 63rd Street, missing more connections in the process. Uh, and in 2001, it opened. The F was rerouted here. The original F ran like this. And then they opened the line that runs the current M. They call it the V. Um, the V went up until 2nd Avenue. The M was always just a BMT line going up until here. And then, they, and then in 2010, they connected the M and the V to maybe relieve the L a little bit going toward Midtown. Um, but also, it was a service cut and was just eliminating some dangling uh, ends. And um, when they opened the V, um, they already had two local lines, the V and the R. So they cut the G to Queens Plaza or Court Square. Uh, and they only ran the G to fire stills on weekends. And over time, through uh, service changes on weekends, off, more often than not, the G would just not be running to Forest Hills. Uh, and in the same service cuts of 2010, they just made it official. The G only runs up to Court Square. Um, so some of the, so the miss here is the IND being planned by dunces. Uh, the miss here is a different dunce planning, but it was not. In, this is not an intentional miss. This is a clutch. Um, so at any rate, the point of um, Tribro was not to serve the most important destinations because they're all on the T, but to be an everywhere-to-everywhere transfer-based system. Uh, and by coincidence, it has okay transfers um, at Jackson Heights to the, to the two main Queens lines. There was also supposed to be, it was supposed to go up until uh, Astoria and transfer to the NW, uh, connect up here, transfer to the M, uh, Broadway Junction. Broadway Junction is not that important a station. Um, it's a transfer with three lines, but it's not that busy. Um, the area here is extremely poor. It might be the poorest neighborhood in New York, East New York. Oh, and um, it's the kind of poverty that comes out of this investment and depopulation. So it's not um, a neighborhood that's poor, but thriving in the sense, is, in the sense that um, it's a stable community that's just very poor and maybe has elevated unemployment, but most people have jobs that just pay very little. 
Um, this is not urban America. Urban America does not have stable, very low paying jobs. Urban America has uh, unemployment. Has, I shouldn't say it has unemployment. It's like the unemployment rate in New York is very high. But if you're poor, it's because it's a lot of instability and a lot of um, people in these situations try to leave. Um, so it's kind of depopulated, or, or rather, this is the East America of 10 or 15 years ago at this point, they're starting to get very low income Bangladeshi immigrants. Um, but, but still, it's a trans, it's an important transportation. And then you curve along the L here. Um, you connect with three, as I said, Brooklyn College. Um, you intersect with all these lines to Coney Island. So, um, so this is based on transfers, which is where a circumferential line should be based on and not on destinations. Um, this is actually good circumferential design. Um, they go to the destinations where they can. So their plan was to have this St. Mary's tunnel that you cannot see on the schematic and go to Yankee Stadium, again, most important stop in the Bronx, um, passing through um, uh, passing through areas that are pretty close to the hub um, for, Bronx, for, um, for Bronx jobs. Um, but, um, the thing is, this is not a completely disused right of way. Um, now the plan in the nineties and the two thousands was to just pick out the freight. Um, there was and remains very little freight traffic on this line today, uh, this section. So from the Southern end to the Northern limit of public ownership, which is here, the intersection with the Montauk line, um, there are, I'm told, between two and four freight trains a day, and I think it's in both directions. So it's one or two in each direction. Um, I may be wrong, and it's two or four in each direction, but even so, it's practically nothing. Um, yes, no, subway weekend service is better than path service. In related news, Mussolini killed fewer people than Hitler. Um, so the... Uh, so at any rate, uh, the plan, I think, was to, I don't think they thought very much about it, and the idea was to pick it out because there was very little, um, and just run it as a subway service in the right-of-way. Um, and here, there's more significant freight traffic, um, and maybe build alongside. Um, now here on the Hellgate line, there are four tracks, or rather, there were four tracks. There are three now, but it's very easy to restore the fourth. Um, the original plan was two passenger, two freight. And uh, the freight was reduced to one track. But again, they can restore the second. It's not, I mean, so sometimes in the United States, they turn a two track line into a single track line that's harder to restore. Maybe it's a tunnel with uh, an arch, and they move instead of two tracks, they have one track in the middle for um, larger clearances for double stack freight. This is not the situation here. Here, they can just restore the fourth track if they need to. Um, and I think the plan was to move the freight, which is more significant here. But it's not busy. I think it was 14 trains per day. I don't remember if in each direction or in both. Um, so the idea was to maybe move them to the Amtrak tracks and then reuse the freight tracks as the subway tracks, uh, and then reuse these tunnels. This is the history. This is the plan for Triborough routes. Um, now the plan was popular among advocates and rail fans. Um, it was even mentioned as a positive possibility by Lee Sander in 2008. I think it was just before the financial crisis, and there was a lot of optimism about building more because Second Avenue subway was just starting construction, and there was the Seven extension, and there was a lot of boosterism about this. Um, and uh, and people could seriously believe that the entirety of uh, yeah, Second Avenue subway phase one was being built and maybe it would be done by 2013 or 2014 and there would be subsequent phases. There was plan NYC, the kind of course plan by Bloomberg. Um, nobody at the time thought about construction costs very much. Uh, they just thought, oh, this is hard to cost and we can do it. And um, one of the things mentioned was Tribal RX, but even then the plan was only to go up until here. The, what to go, where to go beyond Port Morris was uh, left as a, um, as a question mark. Um, and because it was never safeguarded, this tunnel, the Marist tunnel, parts of it, of the right of way were encroached. Um, so it was an existing disused tunnel. Almost people use it. Um, 
I shouldn't say American because it's not purely American, but, but American urban planning works on the principle of hostile architecture. So if there are homeless people, you remove the infrastructure for them. So they filled in parts of the tunnel when they built um, um, when they built um, new buildings here. I think it was this part is the part that was encroached. Um, so at this point, you need to greenfield tunnel if you want to go this way. Uh, at this point, my crayon for the record would be to Greenfield Tunnel a little bit more, but instead of going via Melrose, go via the proper hub to the original destination. Uh, meanwhile, New Yorkers discover commuter modernization. Um, by the fourth plan, the RPA changes its idea of how to do triborough to something that's called crossborough by pen design, which is to use commuter rail for track sharing with freight, they start learning what the London Overground is. Essentially, the London Overground is this um, orbital S-Bahn system, which does share track with freight on the North London line. Um, it's a short section that's being shared, and it's very high frequency. Actually, not very high, this is every three minutes, but I believe it's every eight um, at the... Um, at the peak, uh, maybe normally every 10. So you can squeeze something out of traction with the freight line where the passenger line dominates and where, importantly, the passenger line makes many stops. So you can squeeze freights behind slower trains as opposed to behind faster, non-stop regional and intercity trains. So the idea was to use that and also and just use that um, as a commuter rail, maybe the same track as Amtrak, going up to Co-op City or maybe even New Rochelle as part of the kind of Penn Station Axis. So Penn Station Axis is a plan that was then planned and is currently being built to um, take Metro North trains, the commuter trains, instead of going just to Grand Central, they would use the existing Amtrak line um, out of New Rochelle, um, which was never the main line. It was the, the New Haven line, the, the New Haven Railroad mostly went through Grand Central. But some of its trains ran through to Penn Station, so, and instead used that with more intensity. So, the cro so this crossborough or fourth plan triborough plan is to kind of connect the triborough, but instead of going to Yankee Stadium, just connect it to this kind of weird line that's radial, but then suddenly instead of going to Manhattan or people want to go, would just go to Jackson Heights, East New York, Brooklyn College, and Bay Ridge. And um, this would, but this was something that a lot of advocates wanted in that or some other variant. And at the beginning of the year, in February, um, the governor, the, the new governor of New York, Kathy Hochul, decides that she wants to build a piece of infrastructure that she can call her own. Um, and, and I'm centering the politics because it's going to be important in the story for what I think is um, going wrong with this. Um, so first of all, they realized, the administration, that north of Jackson Heights, especially the Hellgate Bridge part, part is really difficult to build because um, something's got to share with something. So Let's say that you run these trains as Triborough over Hellgate. Um, this, yeah, it was um, only the intercities, and I, I want to say it was only four round trips per day for through service to Washington. Um, why can't they run? Oh, you're asking why can't they run freight overnight? Well, the point is to also run passenger rail overnight because the New York City subway runs overnight. Um, also, separately, if you don't run overnight. You should not run freight overnight, certainly not if it's two to four trains a day. Run them on the shoulders um, at 10.30 at night or 11 at night if the trains are running every 10 or 15 minutes. And the reason is that if you're not running passenger trains overnight, you should keep an overnight window for maintenance. It's much easier to do maintenance the system shuts down overnight way than the New York way of ersatz. Uh, I'm saying ersatz is the American way of clodge. But literally, it's also the German word. Literally, whenever they do um, daytime service changes here on, week, uh, on weekends, literally, when they tell you that there's a service change, it's called Ersatzverkehr mit Bussen, like special service with buses, or Ersatzverkehr not with buses. Um, so, uh, the, uh, so, okay, also, Prague, you're talking about the tunnel. I did not mention the tunnel because it's vaporware, but some people and some people include um, the Jurassic era Congressman Gary Nader, 
group does this mostly out of Nebiazan. Um, they support this tunnel called the Cross Harbor Freight Tunnel, which goes from Bay Ridge to Brooklyn and is supposed to run trains. There's some planning, there are some planning documents for it. That's where I'm drawing the freight traffic from it. So this is, this would be numbers from the late 2000s. The numbers are supposed to be rising a little bit, but it's mostly held as safeguarding in case this is ever built, which is kind of weird. America does not safeguard. I just gave you the example of how St. Mary's Tunnel um, was overbuilt. Um, so there are also routine examples for Second Avenue Subway, where buildings that go in, that in the, uh, the buildings that go in the way of a line that's been planned for generations have been built. Um, it's all over America. I, I was told that there's some kind of doctrine that safeguarding is considered a taking, so you have to compensate, um, which is stupid. In Britain, you can safeguard forever. In Italy, you are allowed to safeguard, but only for a few years, so you can't safeguard forever for vaporware. Um, and somehow, in this country that does not safeguard, um, it's considered okay not to build passenger infrastructure, because what if this tunnel is ever built, and there's going to be um, heavier, although it's still not heavy, freight traffic? Uh, for the record, if they have money to build this, they have money to build this, the tunnel to Staten Island, um, by w their favorite mode of transportation, I would favor commuter rail, but Staten Island to the railway to the one or something is inferior, but it's still viable. Um, and so the, um, so this is the, the tunnel that Prague is talking about. Uh, and anyway, um, Hellgate, let's say the driver was built over this. Hellgate has freight. Freight is not very heavy, but is significant. Um, it's, again, in the Cross Harbor Freight Tunnel planning doc, they said 14 trains a day. And again, forget whether in one or both directions. Um, I believe it's gotten heavier since. Um, and it's owned by freight railway, so taking them out can be done, but it is not trivial. And uh, then there's Amtrak, um, which does have plans to expand, which are kind of vaporware. Then there is Penn Station Access, which is not vaporware. Honestly, Amtrak is so slow, Penn Station Access and Amtrak are basically the same speed, so that's a freebie. But it does mean heavier traffic here, which means that you can kick out the freight and move it to these tracks, but it constrains how much passenger rail you can run. And there are Vaporware and non-vaporware plans for growth that make track sharing with freight very difficult. Not impossible, very difficult. Um, and then there is so and then triborough. So something's gotta share. Um if uh, if all of these four are built. Um again, I don't think it's impossible, but I do think it's very difficult. Uh, and at the end, especially if you can get construction costs under control. At that point, you might just say, I have this video from a few months ago at Penn Station, you might just do a um, four-line pen um, where you're building an entirely new set of tunnels in addition to Gateway. Um, so Gateway is this project. Uh, this, one, this is what it should be, it's this project. So in addition to Gateway, you build another set of tunnels just for Amtrak. You use the footprint of Penn Station um, if you rebuild the station, but the tunnels are new. And then you also bypass Hellgate. Um, but again, that's contingent on low construction costs. This is not a region with low construction costs, unfortunately. And um, so because of this mess, they figured that it was easier to just end this here. Um, so the governor's plan dropped the name Triborough because it's only two boroughs, not three, to the point that it's affectionately called Biborough by some people. Um, but they call it Interborough Express, or IBX. So what is I so this is the history behind IBX up until when it was actually planned. Uh, now this is Yeah, no, um it's not that Congress likes that it is to ha that it has to be accommodated to um in the future. Um Congress is not a unitary arm organ. Congress is Exit. So Congress normally is two parties on important things, but this is not an important thing at national scale. So at that level of pettiness, it's 435 members of the House with very petty opinions about things. 
And um, Nadler specifically wants this for NIMBY reasons. The trucks that currently go between Jersey and uh, um, it's not so much Manhattan, but geographic Long Island, so Brooklyn, Queens, and proper Long Island, um, go over the bridge, over the George Washington Bridge, and then they go um, on freeways that are partly in his district. And um, so it's kind of an NIMBY way to remove, to and I shouldn't say remove, it's supposed to only cut um, truck traffic 10%, um, only across the bridge, um, which is not nothing. This is, the, the project is vaporware. It's not useless. It's just vaporware. Um, and part, part of the issue is also that there's not a lot of good freight distribution within the city. So the idea is to just truck, instead of truck over the bridge, truck from Aspen. So um, it's Upper West Side NIMBYs who want fewer trucks versus Central Queens NIMBYs who don't want this to be a truck depot. Uh, and so far, the Queens NIMBYs are winning. By default, as I mentioned, the project is vaporware, too expensive, not really being done. And, um, oh, uh, no, Queenslink is, yeah, great. Queenslink is another thing that I'm going to mention because um, a lot of advocates, um, a lot of advocates, including ones that I know personally, like Andrew Lynch, aka Van Schnooker and Ragan, uh, this guy, um, probably the most important Koreanista in New York, and Koreanista is usually a term of, derogation, and I better use it affectionately, not derogatorily, like, the, the, um, not derogatorily, he is, he, he's kind of like me in the sense of having started as a crayonista and as, as a pure crayonista and learned how to do subway planning from this, oh, let's build a sign, wait, why do we need, what is the market, maybe there's a better, maybe there are better options, that's kind of what he does, um, he does this as an advocate, um, he, was working with people pushing something called Queenslink. It's, um, it's one of these other disused lines. It's this one. This is actually disused completely. Um, parts of the right of way have been encroached, um, but not exactly in the sense of lack of safeguarding because it's public right of way that's owned publicly. It just it was not maintained, so people started using it for um, parking. And um, let me see if I can find parking. Some of it is visible on Google Earth. Um, here it was. This is school bus parking, um, and it was it, it was left unnoticed for so long that they actually can claim it for its possession um, as squatters, um, which means that the city needs to buy them or the state needs to buy them out. And it's probably to buy them out for very little. This is not very valuable land, um, but the idea is to build this as a more direct route from the Rockaways, including the connection to JFK. Um, toward Manhattan. Right now it runs on the A train. Uh, so the route would be to run like this via downtown Brooklyn and downtown Manhattan. And, and so instead of going, so let me switch to geographic accuracy. So instead of going like this, the idea is to go like this, which is more direct to Midtown. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, a lot, it's, a, it's a system that has certain drawbacks. Um, one of the drawbacks is that you're cutting off far cells. Far cells um, is here. Um, if you're doing commuter rail, I guess you can, but it's but the frequency is going to be weird. Not bad, just going to be weird with the way the rest of the system works. Um, so the stupid thing with Queensland is that uh, is that they had so because so there were two competing proposals for how to use the right of way. The first is make it a train. Um, what the train train connector was never specified, but it's usually meant not as a commuter extension, but as a short extension with a subway. Um, and the other possibility was to build a park, um, just a long linear park where people would think that this is going to be the next High Line. Um, it obviously is not going to be the next High Line. The whole point of the High Line is it's in Manhattan, in a very high traffic place of Manhattan, a very growing part of Manhattan, the meatpacking. Um, district where Google is, uh, and that place in Manhattan that was that had so lots of jobs and a severe shortage of parks. So even if you know nothing about New York City, you probably know that there are fewer jobs and there's less density here than in than here in Manhattan. And second, shortage of parks. Remember, does this look like a shortage of parks? 
of short, like a shortage of parkland. No? Okay, yeah. Um, this is this is going to be a total flop as a park. Um, essentially, the mayor decided that he's going to make it a park. Again, it's not a lack of safeguarding. I'm pretty sure it's deliberate. Um, it's, it's a deliberate snub um, to people who want it to be a train um, and support for NIMBYs. I shouldn't say the word NIMBYs is too much, but it's people who are also NIMBY and have like a very neighborhood-centered way of viewing the world. Uh, who wanted a park because essentially NIMBYs always want more parks and less actual infrastructure. Yeah, it would be the A and N. Um, yeah, so the idea is the M and the A, but um, the but the point of doing it is both the A and the M is to keep the A service. Like, you know, I can say good case for not keeping the A service if there's enough frequency here and just make this transfer. Um, and... Uh, but, but have more service direct to Metam from that. I mean, the A also goes to Metam as well. And at any rate, so with Fiber, with, with Interbar Express, um, as I said, they cut off the Bronx part and made it just IBX. And uh, and the result, this results in this alignment. Um, now, this is something that the governor is throwing her entire heft into it. Uh, so it is a politicized project. It's something that advocates wanted, um, but it didn't come from the advocates. It certainly did not come from any kind of in-house plan. Um, it's not like there were in-house plans for what could we do, and then the governor makes them their own, and makes them not their own, makes them her own, and says that she will fund them. No, this is an early design. And um, the... Uh, and there, there was an alternatives analysis, um, which was very model. But very model, what I mean is they assumed that the line would go like this. Um, they assumed that the freight cannot be kicked out, which is a possibility that should be studied. I don't think it's necessarily a good possibility, and people who I trust on this um, think it's a completely stupid possibility, but it should be studied to see what it does to the infrastructure. Um, again, not here. Here can't. Uh, here both shouldn't and legally can't abandon freight. But here it's also easier. Um, and uh, here you know easier to run, easier to run alongside. And so very modelly focused. Um, they didn't ask freight yes or no. They didn't ask go over go over the Hellgate Bridge to the Bronx yes no. They didn't ask what the stop spacing should be. No, they're not showing you the stop spacing. Um, I mentioned at the beginning, in the third regional plan, the idea was that stops should be spaced every half mile. This is the standard in New York from the 1930s onward. And um, it was also followed for Second Avenue Subway, uh, where the stop spacing for the entire thing is planned from Lower Manhattan to 125th Street. It's, I think, every 900 meters, so basically every half mile, um, leading to some misses that are justifiable but look weird if you don't understand why they're happening. Um, that is to say, second, normally you would expect subway lines to stop at the main streets of the Upper East and West Side, so 72nd, uh, 79th, 86, 96, and 2nd Avenue subway skips 79th. Um, again, this is deliberate. It's just it's a formula for stop spacing. This is half a mile. This is more, if this exists, it would be a lot less. And um, so, uh, the now since then, a lot of people who want more and more express trains have spoken. I do not know how formally or informally. I know a lot of people said this in blog comments. Um, that why not, why, ha why not have fewer stops? These stops are just going to slow me down, kind of thinking. Um, so, fourth plan... Triborough already has way fewer stops. Some uh, um, in areas with dense uh, lines to connect to. So here, I think the stops are only the transfers. Um, so I think it's supposed to go from the F transfers and the Q transfer to Brooklyn College, and then yeah, make more, uh, make a bunch of stops in this long section um, up to Virginia Slavonia with uh, without lines to connect to, um, and that yeah, it should include important streets like Utica, but um, 
but it was not intended to have as dense of a stop spacing, and they didn't study what stop spacing to do, the various options. And so it was just mo um, model. So do they want it to be light rail? Um, they, for some reason, never included the subway option, just light rail as the kind of as a standard urban rail dis uh, disconnected from the mainline network option, uh, BRT, and commuter rail. The commuter rail made assumptions about um, operations that are very trad LIRR um, to the point that even with the exact same stop spacing, commuter rail is said to be substantially slower than light rail. Um, now, new commuter rail rolling stock has the same performance specs as light rail. Um, same initial acceleration, which would be about 1.2, even 1.3 meters per second squared. Um, the initial acceleration essentially tells you what grades you can climb. Um, 1.2 is about 12% of gravitation, which means that you can, if everything goes all right, sit still up 12% grade. And in practice, it means that you can climb, in the limit case, about 7%. Um, and this is essentially the standard for um, both modes. 7% is always used very rare. It's used more in uh, light rail applications because for light rail applications, usually it would not be a long grade. You would not be climbing 7% consistently when you could stall. It's going to be maybe a short, maybe you're running as a tramway, but there's a short grade separation that you need. And then the grade separation you can take as a 7% hell because you're only climbing, let's say, 10 meters in 140 meters, so it's very short. You will be slowed down upgrade, but um, not for very long. And if the train is longer, which is not typical of light rail, but is typical of New York sized subway trains or commuter trains, um, then the effective grade is less. Um, this is, by the way, a general um, trick for grades, for, for short grades on trains. The effective grade is averaged over the length of the train. Um, the effort you need to, let's say, climb two percent a two percent grade, where the length of the grade is half the length of the train, the effective grade is never more than one percent because half the train, while it's on the grade, is going to be on the two up the, on the two percent upgrade, and then half is going to be flat. Um, so, yeah, the plan so same thing the same thing it's a, it was a model it was a purely model uh alternatives analysis um which i think was designed to produce light rail as an option um which is really weird because if they just had subway instead of light rail it would be very good um i think the correct thing to do is probably subway and i say probably uh, if, if you're decided on never expanding this way on um, hellgate and share tracks at least um, and you would need to do some right-of-way widening as a problem, but um, but doing that means, for example, you're doing um, you're using subway rolling stock, and it's not a bad idea. Um, now, now, the fact that they made this light rail is so weird. Light rail is completely alien to the MTA. The MTA does not run light rail. The region does run light rail, but in Jersey, so separate agencies. Now, that by itself is not... Um, deleterious, but the fact that you would need to share maintenance facilities, city and Jersey, and there's no way to connect between them, that makes it deleterious. Essentially, it's introducing an entirely new mode, um, which is why I would back subway or maybe commuter rail. Commuter rail, again, is for the track sharing with freight um, over here um, in the narrow parts of the right of way. And um, again, the commuter rail made all these LRR assumptions that um, it, the trains would have to dwell longer even though these are trains with wide doors and level boarding, they're just used to dwelling for longer. I don't even know why. Um, it's not crowding at the doors. There are only two doors for per, per 25 meter Long Island Railroad car, uh, but they don't have door crowding um, at the suburban stations. So they should not be dwelling for longer than 30 or even 25 seconds in Munich, by the way, on the s -Bahn. Um in Munich on the S-Bahn, doors stay open about 20 seconds. Um, Dwell is maybe 25. It's that fast, and this is city center stations. Um, they do have sometimes Spanish platforms at some of them, so Spanish platforms means 
doors open on both sides of the train uh, and use one side for boarding and one side for getting off. But the uh, but not all of the stations have that, and even then, study center. And I think the LR is maybe 40 seconds or 45 even, which might be schedule padding. I'm not sure, or, or it might be conductors slowing things down. I'm not sure, but it's something that can be done with current tech. It's essentially the same to all the subway or like rail. So the performance spec should be the same. The model choice should be made much later. And essentially it's downstream of how do you share right of way with freight? And um, now this is kind of bad planning. Yeah, it, it doesn't matter. It's design, build, um, operate, and Hudson. Um, the if Hudson County happened to be a Nassau County, they could share maintenance facilities with it. Um, but it's not in Nassau County. It's across a mile wide river. And um, so what they're doing is so it's kind of model um, alternative alternative analysis. It's not bad New York planning or bad hopeful for sandbagging alternatives or bad MTA for not thinking straight. It's bad America. Um, planning in America is very model, uh, essentially because of cost overruns um, on subways in the 1970s that led to ideas about downgrading. So the idea was that, oh, all the subways from the 60s and 70s, the, so the we Bart, Marta, and the Washington Metro, um, they got really expensive. And as the 70s progressed, costs were rising. I don't just mean cost overruns. There were overruns, and a lot of these overruns, plus the later overruns on light rail in the 1980s, were what produced the first research on systematic cost overruns on urban rail in America. It was by a guy named Don Picrell, who was one of, them, uh, one of the sources used by the much more um, global work by Ben Fluvbier on cost overruns, but that, but the origin, but 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 not only were, were costs higher than estimated, but also costs were rising. So the costs, the actual costs, not just relative to budget, but the actual costs in the late seventies were noticeably higher than in the sixties and early seventies, um, even adjusting for the inflation of the era, which was high, um, and uh. There, so there was a lot of poor taste in people's mouth about these heavy rail projects. So so this is one of the factors that led to the light rail boom starting in the late 70s and con continuing through the 80s and 90s. It was, let's make it cheaper. So the plan was to study subway versus uh, light rail. Now, buses were always there, and um, there were problems with ridership shortfalls because they essentially had to transition to a three-mode system, rail, bus, car. Um, from old, like three mass motorization, three split between bus and rail um, planning that has just rail and early cars, like street cars and early cars or something as the model choices. Um, then they hear about bus rapid transit, and there's this idea that we should study bus rapid transit too because it's even cheaper. Uh, and so you're getting this kind of model-based planning where you have to, where everything is going to be studied as, is it going to be BRT, light rail, or um, heavy rail, which means subway or something like a subway. Um, commuter rail can, get, can then be introduced. It's, there's a history to it. It's a bad history, um, but it's something that um, is expected by, let's say, government regulators, like federal regulators expect to see this kind of model planning, um, which is fine. You can do with model planning. It just needs to be in this case secondary to other questions, questions about stop spacing, questions about how to deal with the freight, um, questions about uh, interoperability with whether you're ever going to go into the Bronx, um, also whether you're going to do the cross harbor freight tunnel, but again, this is kind of vaporware, this is not. Um, so, the, uh, so again, this was just at America, but the light rail option is not terrible. Um, they shouldn't. I keep saying they shouldn't study it. They should do it as a subway, but it's uh, or, uh, they should essentially replace it with a subway option. But it's not itself a project killer. It's just going to mean less scale for maintenance. Um, 
And I suspect the reason they're doing like trail on subway ultimately is that the subway has connotations and the idea is to start a new mode because it's easier to make it your own signature and it's easier to maybe have control over how the maintenance is done or something. And the subway essentially includes too much legacy civil service by the MTA about this. This is why I suspect they're uh, light rail. Um, it would not be future expansions to the Bronx or Cross Harbor. So Cross Harbor freight is not very good as a extension for passenger rail. Um, I mean, yeah, if you do commuter rail, you can do this, but it's not going to be very good. Um, this is this is infrastructure that's much more valuable for freight than for passengers, and I also don't think it's that great for freight. And the reason is that passengers have Penn Station. Um, you just ask yourself, what kind of trips are being served by this Penn Station bypass? Um, and remember, um, if it's passenger, so it's not going to be any long distance trips. It's not going to be short ones. Um, and if it's short ones, they need to be very frequent. We're talking a train every 15 minutes, worst. Um, within the city, you need to be every seven and a half or eight, or you do worse than that, people are just not going to ride it. It's a, again, it's a circumferential line. It's an orbital that's designed, that's designed around transfers. Average trip on this line is going to be very short. Seven, like 10 minutes is not good enough. Seven and a half is marginal. You need five. Maybe six. Um, there's a company called Six Minute Service by Riders Alliance. Uh, let me actually find it. Six Minute Service, Riders Alliance. It's uh, increasing the frequency. Uh, it is being discussed in the media already. Uh, let's do Godinist. Uh, very good campaign. Uh, I am not involved in the campaign. I know one of the people who are. And uh, so, I mean, I keep signal boosting them because they are um, because they have this really good idea. Uh, the idea is to... Okay, I can't find their uh, um, fact sheet on this, which I only saw on my phone. But, uh, the, so I can't go to my browser history. But the idea is to run every subway line, except maybe the A branches. But the A itself would be every six minutes, but the branches would be less. Every sub, every numbered or letter subway line, um, at worst, every six minutes, uh, all day, every day, um, up to 10 at night. And uh, also run the key buses. I think they want the top 100 every six minutes. For the record, the key bus thing is a little hairy, but if it's part of the bus redesign, it is trivially easy to do it in Brooklyn. Actually, trivially easy, but it doesn't require more resources. It just requires better planning in Brooklyn. Um, very easy in the Bronx, I think. Pretty easy in Manhattan. Queens is a hard one. Queens is six minute service is a service increase. If you, even if you redesign very aggressively. Um, so, um, so the point of that is that, uh, the service here would just not make good passenger rail service because, okay, you're connecting Bayonne with Brooklyn College. I mean, most people here who are traveling to the city are traveling to Manhattan. So, um, yeah, no, yes, you are creating new connections with us. This is not nothing. It does build up connectivity over time. But to all the, the whole point is that within the city, even if you assume that the destinations stay as they are and no new destinations are made out of junctions, so, for example, no new travel is going to be made to... Uh, okay, maybe no, maybe maybe new travel would be made to Brooklyn College, but there wouldn't be new docks here just because it becomes a junction. Um, even if you assume no changes, and I think that it's a fair assumption, I think the changes are going to be pretty minor, um, you're still connecting. This is still a very good way to connect to Brooklyn College from a bunch of different places in the city. Jackson Heights, same thing. Even if you're assuming that this does not turn Jackson Heights into the next flushing, in this case, a more optimistic assumption is warranted. This is, by the way, I, I'm i slagging on IBX, but IBX is not bad. I think they're making a lot of errors in planning, and I think some of these errors might make it close and effective, but 
it requires a very long lo a very long list of errors to even start making it ineffective and this is because it's a really good idea it's an excellent idea and i'm as i said i'm not as optimistic about what it's going to do to um brooklyn college um east new york same thing the area is so poor that it's not going to create new destinations there um yeah more bangladeshi uh, immigrants, and I say Bangladeshi because, first of all, it's a group that does exist there, and second, um, Bangladeshi immigrants, unlike their Indian counterparts, um, or even Pakistani counterparts in the US and also UK, tend to be from very working class backgrounds. Um, Indian Americans um, and Indian Brit, I believe, in both countries are, their, uh, are, are the richest respective ethnic groups by national origin, both beating white people. Um, now, of course, does it mean that Indians are discriminated against whites? No, it's the opposite. You only get in as an Indian if you have an advanced degree. Uh, I think something like 70% of Indian Americans have a bachelor's degree or higher. Uh, in gen pop, it's maybe 30%. Uh, be 40% if it's only for younger people. And uh, Bangladeshis um, are not like that at all. Bangladeshi immigrants... Uh, tend to have been refugees from the 1970s and then family reunification with the refugees. Um, so much more working class profile. Uh, and in Britain, I think they might be the poorest ethnic group. Uh, now in the United States, they're not, but in Britain, they're still poorer than uh, most, certainly one of the poorest Asian groups because Asian Americans tend to, I mean, the Indian case is an, ex it is an extreme case of you only own, you're only allowed in almost if you're, already middle class, but um, uh, but most other Asian groups are at least somewhere on that spectrum. Uh, and so anyway, the so Jackson Heights is the center of uh, Indian New York, uh, in the same way that there are the ethnic centers of Chinese New York, which are um, Chinatown, Flushing, and to some extent, Sunset Park, uh, in the same way that there are cultural centers for Black New York, the most important is, of course, um, Harlem, Central Harlem, 125th Street, um, also secondarily Bedsai. Um And uh, moreover, um, Asian New York, sorry, it just talked about how Asian Americans are for the most part higher income than um, white people, uh, and it, because they enter the country already degreed um, more, uh, more often than not. Um, however, um, the situation is dicey within the city. Now, most familiar with the story for Chinese New Yorkers, I believe that it is directionally similar for Indian New Yorkers, but much less dark. Um, Asian New Yorkers are by one poverty measure called the Supplemental Poverty Measure, which is supposed to be more accurate about centering housing costs, which are the dominant cost for New Yorkers, especially one who's not very wealthy. And I don't mean not very wealthy as a euphemism, I mean dominant cost for a New Yorker in at least the bottom nine deciles of the income distribution. Um, so um, by that measure, Asian New Yorkers are actually the poorest racial group of the four major ones in the city. Uh, the issue is that um, more assimilated, more upwardly mobile Asian New Yorkers uh, suburbanize. Um, so Chinese New Yorkers tend to be working class Chinese New Yorkers who have not yet made it, and the ones who made it um, have very often suburbanized. Uh, and uh, now this is not unique to Asians, this is also to some extent a black issue, and um, often what you say is that upwardly mobile African Americans in New York and maybe Chicago, often they just move to Atlanta. Uh, and um, but something that's very stark for um, for Asian New Yorkers, where the where um, much of the Chinese American middle class does not live in Flushing, um, not Flushing is especially poor, but they don't. But um, but much of the middle class does not live here, but maybe it's suburbanized here to Long Island, maybe Westchester, uh, Jersey, and it's the same with Indian New Yorkers, um, to some extent again. So. Um, so, the, so the move to the uh, to the suburbs is partially a matter of. A measure of, of, of a measure of success, but also assimilation. So 
So for Indian Americans, it would be roughly Woodridge and Edison. Big, I can say enclave because it's very white Indian mixed. Um, again, this is the, the ones who are more assimilated movie. And why do I mention assimilated? Because kind of the ones who stay behind are the ones who are less assimilated. So, for example, Chinese immigrants who don't speak very good English um, are disproportionately likely to stay in the city. Um, and this means that, um, so that, that turns flushing into just a center for Chinese uh, um, immigrants and these ethnic centers are, they tend to be anchored by people who are wealthier, uh, wealthier, um, so wealthy enough that they can maybe have their own business, but sufficiently unassimilated, they can serve the community. Uh, and, um, this turns, and, and, and this is turning to jobs. Flushing is a growing job center. Uh, now, I suspect something similar can happen to Jackson Heights. And this is something, this is a trend that I think will be accelerated if IBX is built. Uh, so in this way, IBX, most of the city would be serving real transportation needs that don't go to Manhattan, but it would, in Jackson Heights, create them. Um, that said, I don't think with the harbor tunnel such a thing can happen. So I don't think with the harbor tunnel this creation would happen. Essentially the most likely place for this creation, the place where there's the most pre-existing stuff to build out of, which is Jackson Heights again, it's literally the farthest part of the current IBX route from Jersey. So far that um, anywhere where you have commuter rail, so let's say Newark, the fastest way to get into Jackson Heights is to, to into Jackson Heights is to come right into the city and then take the E to Jackson Heights. That's not going to be anything involving IBX. From beyond, yeah, I don't think the HBLR is that great, but that's just beyond. Anything even farther north, it would probably be fastest to do um, HBLR to path, path to E. So this is why I'm skeptical about running this. In the, so, so I'm skeptical about the tunnel. Um, but the tunnel, in the event it is built, I'm skeptical about running passenger rail there. But again, but that's not maybe an IBX. Because again, think ahead. You always want to think where the next lines will build or where the extensions are going to be built when you build your line. Um, and as I said, I think that um, uh, the possibility of going to the Bronx is something that should be studied as an extension just to, the, just to see how it's going to affect planning of what is essentially phase one, this being phase one. This being phase two, not phase one, since of just build a few stations at a time. Um, and uh, and again, they didn't do it, unfortunately. And the other thing they didn't, um, unfortunately, do is they um, uh, is they didn't. And I don't think they thought well enough about how to build the infrastructure in the problem section. So, what are the problem sections? So. Problem, problem section is a section where you can't use the right of way without kicking out or encroaching on freight. Um, and if these get too hard, what, you, what it means is you should encroach on freight, um, probably not kick it out. Again, study kicking it out, but I doubt the answer is going to be yes, you should kick it out. And then share, and then again, don't run the freight overnight, run them at 11 at night or something, so that you still have your maintenance windows if you're not running, overnight, if you're not running the trains overnight. Um, but you actually might as well not. I mean, if you're running run the train, think about it. I mean, if the trains in New York run overnight every 20 minutes. If you're running this every 20 minutes, it's just not going to be worth it, except on a very narrow set of origin destinations. It's okay to have a mix of lines that run overnight and a mix of lines that run overnight and lines that don't. Um, the three train until, I don't remember when, but until, while I, when I moved to New York, the three train did not run overnight. And so the two outer stations in Harlem were closed down overnight. It was well known. If you them. It was it was constantly mentioned on the posters on the one two three train. Um and uh anyway, so um a so what are the easy segments and what are the problems that went? So you might be able to tell so so, so we need to do a little bit of Google Earth tourism. Um you might be able to tell that this is an easy segment, a uh, very wide trench. Uh, now the trench also has this sub. Now this is also a subway service, right? No, no, actually, no, the subway service runs. No, this is a, a subway, yeah, okay, sorry. I was confused briefly, but 
Okay, so here runs the subway, and here's run, and here runs the Bay Ridge branch, which IP access to use. And you might be able to tell that the subway has a lot of spare space. Um, so this is called C Beach Line. Uh, it turns the N. This is West N on the D. And C Beach Line is a four track line. C B there are four tracks um on C Beach Line. And so the uh and, and so you can just weave into them and that's not gonna be hard. Um now as you transition away from C Beach Line, it's a narrower right of way. So let's start to figure out how wide this right of way is. You, you can kind of tell this is more problematic, right? That this is not as great. Um, just here, it's maybe nine meters, and this is only two tracks. Um, now you can modify the right of way. Essentially, there, you, you might be able to tell all the trees that it's sloped. Um, and if you replace these with retaining wall, and if you do more retaining wall work, then you can create more space. Uh, I'm not sure whether you can create enough space for four tracks, but you can create enough space for three, and this is not something where you really need two tracks worth of commuter train. So this is something like, I think, 16 meter. If you, um, and, and this might require, again, just doing right-of-way work, but right-of-way work that does not require new tunnels or new L's. Um, but this does get, but this is around here, and this does get worse as you move here. And I believe the worst section is right around here, around the F and Q transfers. Um, and there, um, you can kind of see how this is even narrower here. And uh, yeah, you have the trees that delineate the uh, end of the right of way, but we're starting maybe here. And then over here, that's, yeah, it's two tracks. So that's where you need to probably run alongside the same tracks, that run, run not alongside, on the same tracks and the commuter rail. And if you're doing some heavy rail, you would need to do something different. The plan is to build it as an elevated viaduct, so to essentially make this a viaduct. Um, as mentioned on, uh, where is it? On 2nd Avenue Sagas. So let me move my face to the other end, just because of how this blog works. So this is contemporary with the original plan in February. So map of um, IBX, uh, map of what they're going to do with the problem functions. So here, and here it's really weird because um, certainly up until the connection with the D, they're running alongside the N, and there's enough tracks they don't need to run on elevated guideways. But here, yeah, this is, again, the, around the FNQ, this is the hard part. Um, this becomes an easy, this is easy. This is the is rounding this corner. Uh, it is this corner. Um, they're saying they need a viaduct. They might need to, I'm not sure. Um, but starting, but the more you move here, this is where the right of way starts being an alternate trench, but elevated. And you might be able to tell um, that this was originally four tracks. So the um so two of them are very clearly overgrown, but you can actually do this. This is an easy section. And uh, so let's look over Remsa. This is again you see this it's kind of it's overgrown. It mean it really drives our work, but overgrown is not hard to fix. It's not a new viaduct. Here and then here is where um um, it's it's on the elevated guideway, but it's an elevated line that already exists. Um, the one thing is there there might be freight customers here, um, but um, that's where you're just making sure you're going to run on a consistent side. Um, and so this I don't think needs a guideway. Um, this is you need the guideway if you're doing fully grid separated. Um, they say light rail, but really it means non commuter rail. You need to run here, not here, not here. This area is easier, and then there's this problem section. 
Um, so now, now here you're running not quite a long distance, a different right of way, but very close to the L. Uh, although not well, uh, although I don't think it's that easy to make this cross-platform transfers with L, which ideally is how it would work. And then you get to here. As I said, up until here, it's owned publicly, up until the connection with the Montauk line, and from here, it's owned by CSX. Now, most of this is wide enough. Now, CSX will insist on ridiculous separation. It always does its surface extraction. Um, and um, but, but the right-of-way is wide enough for this. And uh, the issue is around this, around the cemetery. So first of all, you might notice that um, the bridge over the Montauk line is two tracks, it's not four. Um, it's not four with two overgrown. This is just two. So you need to double this bridge if you don't do commuter rail. Um, and now doubling a bridge is not by itself that hard. It's, an, it, it's a viaduct. It's not a very, uh, it's not a very complex place to build in. You have, you don't have good road access is the problem. Um, but you can use, but, but there do exist service roads that get you most of there. I mean, you look, these are, um, road vehicles that go up until here. Uh, and, um, no residents would complain about overnight work. So you can work arbitrary, that, that you can work on whatever schedule you would like. Um, conversely, this is not a tunnel, so you don't need to deal with the enforced 24 seven running of the TBM. So if for labor or other reasons it is desirable to stop running overnight, you can do that. You can build, uh, stop not running, stop construction overnight, you can do that. Um, the residents here, they don't care. Uh, um, and then you would need to, so you so don't that, so then you need to zap some trees, but this is not a park. This is an undeveloped part of the city, but it is not, it is not a park that residents can use. Um, think about it. It's between, uh, so yes, this is a subway line, it's a bit, but it's a subway line where this section does not have stations up until Metropolitan. Um, so a subway line is just a line with no stations, and here it's a depot, so it's a subway yard. A freight line, another freight line, a cemetery, um, and a parking lot that is not oriented around using the, uh, around park access. You might notice there's no access. Um, it's not. It's not like I don't know some kind of Griffith, some kind of Griffith Observatory situation where you have this giant parking lot, but the giant parking lot that you can drive from all over Los Angeles and um, enjoy Griffith Park because Los Angeles don't have public transit for you to use to access the park the way New York is for Central Park. No, this is just a parking lot for the for the retail here. Um, so this is not a park. You can build here. That's fine. Um, then. Um, this is the bigger problem section. Um, there's a little tunnel here, it's only two tracks. Um, now, mo now, once you get into the trench, the trench is wide enough for four. Uh, let me just zoom in so that I can convince you uh, that you see two tracks overgrowth, but this is actually still part of the trench. So once you're in the trench, you're in the clear. Um, two tracks right, two tracks passenger, um, you might need you might need encroachment or, or widening things for stations, I'm not sure. Uh, but the station would be at Metropolitan anyway, not here. Uh, this is kind of annoying, but it means you, could, you probably need to build a little subway, including a subway station. But that actually is not that hard here. Why? Because there are no living residents to disturb here. That is the important bit. You can just build this cut and cover. You can extend, essentially extend the trench um, as a little tunnel under the cemetery with cut and cover. Um, the place where the cut and cover would go is not where the graves even are. Um, you would need to move this building. Um, if this building is completely immovable, it can instead build around here, but that does make things hairier. Just move this building. 
what it's what like from here up until here, and then go back above ground. It's 160 meters of cut and cover. Uh, very routine. Um, this would include the subway station. Uh, if it's too difficult to do the subway station here, then tunnel and then do the subway station here next to Metropolitan, next to either the way it's next to Metropolitan. Probably you would want the subway station above ground anyway um, for the easier transfer to the end train. And um, then, and yeah, you're again, so you're not disturbing living people. You don't need to move graves. And um, this is tunneling, and tunneling is scary, but it's easy tunneling. It's cut and cover. It uh, is on every institutional engineering easy. Uh, no, engineering. It, on every institutional engineering matter, actually easy. Um, so what I mean by, by engineering, first of all, cut and cover is generally easy to do when you can do it. What I mean by institutional, um, first of all, I don't know to what extent MTA Capital Construction knows how to cut and cover anymore. Um, they would need to read it in internal history books. Uh, but it's something that they can do reading internally. Um, scale matters very little in cut and cover, unlike with the tunnel boring machine. Uh, actually, labor is easier. If you're doing top-down cut and cover construction, um, my understanding is that you do not need to use the Sandhogs Union. The Sandhogs have jurisdiction over deep tunneling. As, as I understand it, um, you would still need to pay prevailing wages, and these are New York trades uh, worker wages, which are absurdly high. Um, but they are not. They're not going to kill your project. They're not going to. I don't think you need um, v um, overly high staffing levels. And while the New York trades wages are absurdly high, um, there's something like 1.5x too high. Um, and labor on a, a normal project is not 100% of the cost. So it's not even a 1.5x one, a 1. increase in cost. It's 1.5x increase in 25% of the cost, whereas with deep tunneling, it's maybe 3x with all the um, overstaffing and, and, and the sandhog and, and, st and stuff that's special to the sandhogs. Um, so 3x on 25%, is it 1.5x increase in general? 1.5x on... 25%, that is what? Um, uh, that is 12.5%, 1.125x. Who cares? Um, antagonizing labor is a means to an end. If it does not serve the end, do not do it. No need to antagonize labor, which means that this is, uh, as I said, an institutionally easier tunnel. The procurement needs to be fixed. There is no big political interest group that is wedded to um, design build to PPPs. I mean, PPPs, it's maybe Republicans who hate the idea of having a government, but not important in New York State. And uh, there, there's no interest group that is wedded to the MTA not being able to do any kind of in-house planning or in-house design. So... The stuff that needs to be fixed to make this cost like a normal tunnel, and again, this is about 160 meters, uh, normal tunnel cost globally is to do this in $20 million, $30 million maybe. So this is just not hard. Um, and you can even take a little bit, not a big, but a little bit of a New York premium on, on the engineering, not the procurement. The procurement would affect the entire line. And if a 30 million turn into, think about it this way, if a 30 million turn to 80 million, it's an extra 50 million on a line that's currently supposed to be single digit billions. They're not going to tell you how many, like what the first digit is. It had better be one. Um, but even on at low end, I mean, the extra $50 million is not perceptible. And... That would still make and that would make this tunnel one of the most expensive ever built um, in the world if you exclude New York projects. If it's eighty million for this, um, it's that easy. And yeah, exactly. Yeah, the building. Yeah, we can't tell what the building has. The building 
if the building is a mausoleum, you would need to move the mausoleum, and that will piss people off when you can move mausoleums. Um, graves have been I mean, graves have been exhumed for infrastructure before. Um, mausoleum and mausoleums are like mausoleums are much easier. There's no sense that you're like disturbing the grave. Um, and again, I'm not even sure this is a mausoleum, but either way, you're not disturbing. I mean, yeah, maybe you're moving the mausoleum, but Okay, move the mausoleum. I mean, there's space here to move the mausoleum to. Um, and so, again, I don't know if this makes the subway, or what they call the light rail option, superior to the, uh, sorry, inferior to the commuter rail option, where the commuter option would just run on these tracks, upgraded tracks, but same tracks. Um, maybe you would quad track issues if you're, maybe you would do a, a bunch of quad track where it's easy, just, to permit some kind of overtaking. Um, but um, the but again, it's something needs to be planned more carefully in terms of trying to figure out timetables, trying to figure out how to share right of way with, not share right of way, how to share tracks with freight. And unfortunately, it's not being done. It's done this model-based planning. Um, and, uh, and this is where it start, and this is where it starts are other projects where I think that they might actually make enough mistakes to make this both ineffective, which is impressive. Um the Triber RX plan was said um so in, in this did I ask something already? I may have. Um the Triber RX plan uh was said to be the fastest way to get to work in the conditions of I guess the late nineties, early two thousands. Uh, for uh, for 76,000 people, so times two, it's 152,000 commute trips every day. Uh, I imagine it will have increased since. Not by much. New York City is not booming. I mean, economically, it's doing well, but the but it but its population growth is not great, and um, the job growth exists. Not, but again. Expected this would also shape job growth around here, especially, but a lot of the job growth has not been great for this. Um, so anyway, um, if you take 152 as your anchor, uh, at second avenue of subway phase one for rider crossed, uh, it is going to be it's going to be what? Um, second avenue of subway phase one cost 4.6 billion, but that was in the dollars of eight years ago, and there has been inflation since. So it's more like six nowadays. Um, and uh, six, it's supposed to have, it, it was supposed to, it was, 2019, 2019, the ridership at the three new stations plus the X ridership at uh, 63rd Street, the uh, station that is that did exist before this one, but was, but now also a second avenue subway service. So you do this minus the ridership before opening and you add these three stations, you multiply by two because boardings and lightings, um, you would get to 160,000 people already, uh, 160,000 weekday trips. The ridership projection said 200,000, but it would take more than three years to get there. Now, obviously nowadays it's a lot less than 160 because of um, post pandemic changes in ridership. Um, my understanding is that this is supposed to be a temporary blip, a long temporary blip, not just a one year thing, the way that it was um, here, where ridership has already recovered to pre corona levels. But um, it's supposed to, by let's say the mid 20s, recover. Um, so the ridership was on track. So that would be about $30,000 in 2022 prices per weekday trip. This is very cost effective. In America, in 2022 prices, in 1970, even in 2022 prices, in 1970s, GDP per capita would be horrific. But GDP per capita is higher than it was in the 70s. Um, so at 30,000, 150, it's 4.5. Now, uh, there shouldn't be utility problems. Um, there might be, oh, there might be some kind of weird utility line there, but um, first of all, that's institutionally more fixable. Second, a lot of the utility problems are specifically for residential things. It's a graveyard. Um, graveyards don't 
have a lot of pipelines for electricity. They have some, but not that much. Um, so the now this is a smaller project uh, because I'm going to the Bronx. Um, the ridership projection, um, I want to say it's about a hundred thousand or seventy to a hundred thousand or something like that. Okay, even without this third borough, the MTA believes that seventy-four to eighty-eight thousand passengers per day, and it's eighty-eight because seventy-four is with compromises about BRT or about their assumption that commuter rail is uh, not going to be as fast as light rail. Um, so it's about eighty-eight thousand, let's say, um, which I think is too pessimistic, but maybe a underrate the extent to which the Bronx connection is important for driving ridership for the original Tribra. Um, at APA, again, you need about $2.5 billion to make this second avenue subway, and you can do a lot better. Uh, and $5 billion is like the grown, $5 billion is about the grown threshold. And, and the thing that makes me sad is that they might actually be able to surpass the growth threshold and hit 5 billion. Um, the longer viaducts are necessary, for example, um, very complex things around here. Um, they have this plan to do light rail, but not put light rail in a tunnel, but then but zigzag, which would be a lot slower. So maybe that, um, that might, it's partly a ridership increase if you build it in a weird way, but also the zigzag reduces ridership. Um, they're trying to avoid much interface with CSX, um, and I get why they're doing this, but at some point, this compromises the project beyond viability to the point that there are people who have never thought much of the idea of Fibro as a continuous orbital, um, to, to the point that you might, that, again, another thing that I think was missing from the IPX planning as an option is not to even have a continuous orbital, but instead, Take the L and extend it to Bay Ridge along this section, and then take the M and extend it to Jackson Heights or maybe in the Bronx along this section. It would make the M look really weird because the M with the V connection, the M would so look the M. Okay, let me see that you can actually look because I never remember the limit of my head. Okay, so I need to move a little bit like this. The M starts here. Historically, it would go into Lower Manhattan, uh, and then they connect it with what was then the V, uh, and then it goes like this, and then it would be this kind of weird thing, this kind of weird accidental orbital that would take the M and take it to Jackson Heights as a kind of weird loop through Manhattan and then with a little tail to Forest Hills. It's a really awkward thing. It's a really awkward line. I understand why they're going to avoid it. Um, awkward lines sometimes exist when you cobble together services like that. Um, for example, Tokyo has that on the Oedo line. And uh, and again, it's really awkward, but it might be the right solution. Um, and uh, and the thing is that this, is, this requires CSX interface, but the thing with the L would not. Um, and so the problem is, as I said, at the very beginning, um, once they transitioned from the history of Triborough to the history of IBX, IBX did not originate in planners. It is the governor's baby. The governor wants it as a way of showing that she can build things. She may well be right. The project is moving very fast. Uh, and the reason it's moving very fast is that it's very clear that it's a priority for the governor. So all of the little petty actors, instead of saying we can't, say we can, but give us this extra. And um, now usually give us this extra kind of thinking also slows down the project. Um, but it does mean, that for, but I suspect that they're rushing the design for the same reason. And this leads to, to problems that are called in the literature early commitment. Um, the people to read are Ben, uh, or not Ben, uh, Ben Schubert is, uh, is aware of it now. It's, uh, it's Beth Van V, uh, who is at 
helps when I've talked to him. He is very insightful. Um, and um, Chantal Cantarelli, uh, who Cantarelli, yeah, who is I don't actually know where she's from, but the name sounds maybe she, she would be Italian. She's in she's based in Britain. She did work in another thing. She might might have been a student of Anve. Um, essentially, what they figured out is something called, and I think it was Cantarelli figured it out, and they was the advisor, um, that a big mechanism for cost overruns is when you commit to a project too early. Uh, and the example they gave was the high-speed line in the Netherlands. Um, let me see if I can find a map of European high-speed rail. The answer is yes, I can. I do not know whether it's going to be a good map. So let's do high-speed rail in Europe the third most important place in the world for high-speed rail after China and Japan. Um, and I'm not, not individual country. Europe, I'm pretty sure Japan has more ridership on high-speed trains in all of Europe because uh, it's going to be, what, 120? Who the hell knows? This is 140 or something, but that includes the intercity lines that are not high-speed rail. 60, 20. These are rounding errors in Britain. is not have high-speed rail. Um, so yeah, Japan is about 400, so Japan has more ridership than Europe on high-speed trains. Um, I wish to, uh, thank every petty national politician who underinvests in making, you see how Paris to Strasbourg is fast, like fast-ish, not quite fast-ish, things. Berlin to, uh, it's 200. Like you have these kind of slow down, but okay-ish Berlin to Frankfurt line, then Frankfurt to Mannheim is not terrible. They're overcrowded, but not terrible. And then Mannheim to the LGV S is slow, and this is not fast either. There are too many slowdowns here, and so uh, yeah. Um, good job to all involved for making the trip from Paris to Berlin infeasible in a single day, unless you're a masochist. If you do know masochist, Paris to, so think of it this way, this is an hour 47-ish. This is not much longer distance, and this is four hours, because how slow this is. Good job, for, good job everyone. At any rate, um, high-speed rail is mostly for large countries. Um, you might notice that, high, that the high-speed rail proper color, red, um, or power color purple, is absent from Austria. Is it because Austrian rail is bad? Absolutely not. Austrian, uh, Austria has, I think, the... I want to say Aust I'm forgetting whether Austria has the highest or the second highest model split for intercity rail in the EU. The other one is another one. The best in Europe is Switzerland, which is unfortunately elected not to join. Switzerland is small. And there's some... There's yellow. This is actually a Greenfield 200 kilometer an hour line that was built to make sure... Theory to Bern and Basel to Bern would be in a little bit less than an hour each to fit into the hourly clock face timetable with all the transfers. But, um, but, uh, and on the base tunnel, I think the height, I think you can do 250 on tilting trains, but this is not mainly a passenger line. 32 Milan, 32 Milan is, I think, even with this speed up, I think the average speed is maybe 90 kilometers an hour end to end. So, um, the strength of a small country's intercity rail network is not from high-speed rail. Large country, yeah. The strength of the French high-speed rail line, uh, uh, not, not high-speed, but they're already assuming something. Um, oh, uh, sorry, Prague, you're saying one question with light rail. Can you inter, can you interline this? Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't think this is a good interlining line. Um, Again, the L and M break might be a good option, but I really don't see this otherwise interlining with something. And the reason is that the, uh, and but by the way, it's also an R. I would also be wary about doing it as an L branch. You would need essentially each L branch on every six minutes. So the L trunk every three uh, to make this um, viable because of the short length of the average trip. Um, and there's no, I mean, you can, there are some 
interesting tram lines on the street that can be built in New York, but nothing near Triborough because the whole point, or, or Interrail Express, because the whole point of Interrail Express is it's so much faster than them that it would replace them. In the same way that, for example, in Vancouver, um, in Vancouver, there's this really solid grid of north, south, and east, west buses. Uh, in both, uh, both Toronto and Vancouver have these really good bus grids, and then the purpose of the subway is to in Vancouver, there's one diagonal line where it was viable, i.e. where right-of-way existed. Uh, that's, the expo, that's the expo line. It's in a disused, I mean, no longer disused, but disused in the 1980s uh, inter-urban from before mass motorization. Um, but otherwise, they're kind of grid accelerators. So what does it mean there's a grid accelerator? So you have all these really strong north-south corridors for buses and east-west corridors for buses. And you might be able to tell by the black color, which in this, in this city, unlike in New York, is also for, used for tunnels. So there's the Canada Line um, subway here. And what did this do? So before the Canada Line was built, as you might expect, Canby, this road, was the busiest north-south bus. And but, what, but once that was built, not only was ridership on this bus killed, but also ridership on this bus is a footnote, and ridership on this bus on Granville is also meh. Um, now, ridership on Maine is much stronger, I will say, um, but essentially this killed buses within a noticeable radius, a bit in one direction, much more than in the other. So, um, in the presence of Triborough Rx, um, or an L extension even, the smallest section thereof, in the presence of that, really strong bus corridors, and let me put my post on this. So this is a Brooklyn map, which is why, uh, or not even an all of Brooklyn map. This is me screen grabbing part of the uh, Brooklyn bus map and then drawing IFBX on top of it. In the presence of this, all the really busy um, cross town buses, so B35 on Church especially, um, but, but also the weaker ones, things like B11, B9, um, probably also even the farther away one, like B6. B82, these get murdered. Because if I'm from like this part of the city, Coney Island, and I'm trying to get to Canarsie today, uh, I take the B82. Or I just don't take the trip because it's too slow. With IBX, I take literally any train that departs Coney Island. All of them will lead to a transfer station to IBX. And then it connect to IBX. And the IBX maybe doesn't take me exactly here, but it does connect me to the L if I need to. It connects me here, which is close enough. This is not a big destination. Um, or I can even transfer it. A second time, if it's that critical that I go here. And it's going to beat the bus. It's going to beat the one seat right on the wall. Um, the way back is a little more annoying because I need to choose which of the lines of hit Coney Island they go to, but um, you can just run them relatively. Um, you can run some of them relatively frequently and should be okay. Um, and, um, and of course, with the church, it's kind of the same thing. So it's, it's even closer and slower, church. So um, this is why you can't really branch this, um, because where are you going to branch? Um, there aren't good destinations that are right off. This is what I mentioned in this post. Uh, the hospital, maybe, but how the hell are you going to get from from Interborough Express to the hospital? I mean, you can run on the street, but it's going to be incredibly awkward. Just, I don't know, go on Nostrand or something, and Nostrand doesn't quite get you there. It's actually running only to the hospital, not to any other destination. What I'm saying is that the Kings County Hospital is just in a terrible location relative to the transit system, um, to the point that probably the most transit-oriented thing you can do with it is to essentially grow it towards the subway. Um, it was a big thing when we were doing the Brooklyn bus redesign, Eric and I. Eric and me, I guess, when we were doing it. Um, um, just to, uh, we wanted this to be an intersection between two buses. It was just too difficult. Um, the streets don't go through. Even the the little streets don't go through. Albany is too far. Um, this is Albany. Um, you have Clarkson, but Clarkson is not otherwise a strong corridor for a bus. Um, and so anyway, what do you want if you want to make the hospital more transit-oriented? This is where, again, thinking about development is important. Um, 
he wanted to grow the hospital. He wanted to essentially build the wing of the hospital over here and then connect them with overpasses. Um, so the subway is at least to an extent viable. Um, I mean, still a lot of walking away in the hospital, but it's at least viable. Um, and at any rate, so this is so we're going to get back to TOD in a sec. I do want to return to the Dutch case of uh, I do want to return to the Dutch case of um, early commitment. So high speed rail in Europe is not mostly a small country thing. It's a big country thing. The center base of French intercity rail is the Tegev. France has let at this point with French stagnation and German growth. Germany does beat France on intercity rail ridership, but France still beats Germany per capita. And in France, the average trip is much longer. Essentially, the German system of high frequency, high hourly, um, of hourly frequency and time transfers that trains don't always miss due to horrific delays, um, that system is good for short trips. France doesn't do that, but France does have a very high average speed. The average speed between Paris and Marseille is 230 kilometers an hour almost. I mean, it depends because sometimes they're slowed down due to unreliability, but we, yeah, I believe it used to be 240 and it's been slowed down to about 230. Um, I think Germany averages that. I think the fastest major city to major city trip would be Frankfurt to Köln, and that's about 170. Um, Berlin Hamburg, actually, is, despite being a legacy line, it's, Mediums, it's 230 kilometers the entire way, or 200 to 230 the entire way with tilting trains. So they're high maintenance costs, but they do average. They're capable of averaging 190, I think. It's supposed to be doable in an hour and a half, or even less, 280 something kilometers. They do it in an hour 40 because of a lot of timetable padding. Um, again, poor reliability in Germany. Um, but, um, the, um, but in France, this is, this is 170, this is maybe 170 ish. Uh, this you might expect is a long line. I mean, sure, but it's 250 kilometers an hour. And uh, the major cities here, like Hannover and Wiltzburg, and even on them, the average speed is like 150, 160. Um, and, it does, and you need to go slower to get to any of the biggest cities, Hamburg, Frankfurt, München. Again, I'm, I can slag out a German flying forever, but the point is that in France, the high speed is really good for inducing long trips. Um, so France leaves um, money on the table when it comes to short trips, without saying that Germany leaves money on the table for long trips. Now the Netherlands, the original case study for early commitment. The Netherlands, as I said, I believe near Trace Austria for second highest um, rail passenger kilometer model split, which mostly counts intercity. In Europe, the highest being Switzerland, by far. Um, and the Netherlands barely has high-speed rail. So you might notice, that, oh, there is high-speed rail for next Amsterdam, Rotterdam, and Antwerp. Well, yeah, first of all, the average speed here is kind of shit. But second, that is not the strength, the source of strength of Dutch intercity rail. Um, yes, Amsterdam and Rotterdam are the two largest city, but you might be able to tell they're close. They're close to each other. Holland is incredibly dense. Um, the Netherlands in general is dense. Holland is especially dense. I think Holland is about a thousand people per square kilometer. Um, Amsterdam to Rotterdam um, is 60 kilometers. That's not where you're doing high speed rail. And yeah, it goes to the Belgian border um, to Antwerp, but this is mostly internal. The line passes, I don't think the line passes through Breda. I think there's a branch to Breda. Um, what are the, the other cities are not on the line? I mean, they, I mean, there's the Hague, where the Hague is not literally between. It's accessed via Rotterdam. Um, there's Utrecht. It's not on the line. It's accessed um, on separate lines from Amsterdam from Rotterdam. Um, there's the stuff that's not Holland or Utrecht, which is vaguely greater, which is Greater Holland, really. Um, there's I don't know. Uh, all, all, there's all the stuff in the in the south. So again, Breda's on a branch, but um, Den Bosch. Um, Eindhoven, the, these are separate lines. It's, it's, there's one line from Amsterdam to through Utrecht, Den Bosch, um, Eindhoven. Um, it's, I think it averages about the same as New York to New Haven, about 110 kilometers an hour, maybe. 
sorry, it averages, no, it's not what New York New Haven averages, what New York New Haven should average. Um, but I believe this line averages about 110. Um, runs every 10 minutes. Uh, four out of six trains run direct Amsterdam to Eindhoven. Two out of 10, two, two out of six um, make you transfer, I forget whether cross, cross platform, I think cross platform, it either Atrust or, or Den Boss, I don't remember which. Um, so it's a very tight, very dense transfer based system with medium average speeds. Yes, there's also a high speed line between the two large cities, but they're 60 kilometers apart. Who gives a shit whether you're running 300 kilometers an hour or not? So the, so the early commitment issue is that in the early 90s, um, the idea of a transfer based system. Yeah, it existed as, as, an, as an accretion of things, but there was no plan to make that the exact thing you're going to do. It was happening in Switzerland at the, at the time with Bond 2000, but that was explicitly an alternative to high-speed rail at much lower cost due to um, right-wing, terms of right-wing, center-right fiscal conservatism. Um, in the Netherlands, in contrast, they looked up to the French TGV, um, they decided they needed 300 kilometers an hour and they planned everything around that. They committed, in effect, too early to the idea of high-speed rail. So what did they do? They did build it, but they built it to excessive standards. They did not need 300 kilometers an hour. Um, um, Praga will talk about this in a second. Uh, they did not need 300 kilometers an hour. They needed probably 200, maybe 250. Um, 300 is useful if you're going Amsterdam to Brussels at speed or Amsterdam to Paris. But the problem is, while Paris to Brussels is fast, this Paris to Brussels is an hour and a half. Brussels to Rotterdam is by itself, which kind of comes to how much closer this is also about an hour and a half. Um, because, Brussels, um, because Brussels to Antwerp is slow. Um, there are plans to make it fast, but it's Belgium, but even that would be Belgium fast, not actual fast. This is slow, and this is Belgian fast, not fast. Um, so, um, and even then, I mean, so, um, that would require some kind of pan-European thinking about linking the largest cities of Europe. So, yeah, 300 kilometers an hour is good if you're centering international travel. So that would mean also filling in the gap, Brussels, Antwerp, for example, uh, Antwerp, um, making it so that trains can go through Brussels in less than seven minutes for four kilometers. Um, having a pricing system on Talis that does not deter riders who are not obscenely wealthy. Um, the domestic trains in Europe are affordably priced. Um, they might be affordably priced in a airline style yield management way, as in especially Spain, but also to a, large, to a very large extent France. France is also very yield management from hell, but the uh, base system but 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 the base system is affordable to the general public even if you don't do weird low cost stuff. Um Spain leans hard on leans even harder on the airline mentality. Um Germany does not do that and averages the same fares as France. Um but that's domestic. And also France Germany. France Germany I, I flagged on it for being slow, but the fares uh between France and Germany are normal. There's a lot of cooperation between them and it's just slow. Uh, across the world. But France to the north, this is Eurostar, so very business like, just about business travelers, is very overpriced. France to work Belgium, it's called, uh, and, and also the lines doesn't go to Germany through um, through here, but going north via Brussels and Cannes. That's all. It's a, it's a service called Thales, owned by SNCF, but not very well integrated with it, and priced for business travelers. So you would do this kind of 300 kilometers an hour. Again, that's valid, but you need to lean on other things and it means not make Thales as useless for the non-rich as it is. Um, it also led to uh, overbuilding, for example, um, they tunneled a little bit here. Now, what is the one thing everyone knows about Holland? About the topography of Holland. Um, it's also a, a topography that might be uh, reflected in the name of the country that Holland is in, the Netherlands. Um, so you have this place that is famous for having literally no mountains, no hills. Yeah, yeah I have some bluffs near the coast that are 20 meters. 
the interior, like the main of Holland, is below sea level. So you have this place where you would be running on the ground because there's no mountain. There's no reason to ever, you know, you would certainly not tunnel because it, it, you're below sea level. The tunneling is difficult. Um, the, the geology is not good for tunneling. And what did they do? They tunneled 20% of the line um, because they because they decided it was um, a priceless agricultural land. Because again, they'd already committed to 300 kilometers an hour. Once the political commitment had been made, people could make unreasonable demands, like build us a tunnel. Or you're going to say, no, you're going to walk away. You've already committed to this being high-speed rail rather than part of a broader program of improvements in intercity rail. Improvements that the Netherlands did do and are the source of Dutch rail success today, not the high-speed line. So this is the problem with premature commitment, with early commitment. You're getting lines that, first of all, are maybe spec wrong. They maybe eliminate options um, that could be... It could be building less in the case of New York, it could be maybe the L and M extensions as opposed to doing a, contigu a contiguous thing, but it could even be building more. In this case, it would be um, eliminating the option that, that makes the 300 kilometers now more viable, but be making it part of a pan European plan to have an all fast route that, yeah, maybe will not average Paris to Marseille because there are more cities in the way, but it would average, to, but it would average at least 200 Amsterdam, Rotterdam, let's say you're skipping bread on the main, Antwerpen, Gritsa, um I don't even know how they pronounce it. The European capital, Brussels. Um, you're skipping Lille because Lille is on the London branch of the Y, so, of the Paris, Brussels, London Y, and then non-stop Brussels to Paris. I mean, so in the same way, this is a problem of early commitment and politicization. When the decision to, not the decision to proceed, which is always political, but when the, the decision to start is made at a political level. The the distinction is that the decision to proceed would be a good project like the Swedish project, the one that are the, the 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 ones that are maybe running a lot over budget, but are uh, first of all running over a very low budget, and second, the overruns is because of very different reasons. Uh, they essentially change the regulations midway through for no good reason. Um, in Sweden, what happened was the um, planners figured they needed more rail capacity uh, to build um, Citybanen and Nya Tunnelbanen, and these became the projects Citybanen and Nya Tunnelbanen. Um, and I'm not going to say more because it was literally my video from last week. Um, and there's also a written version. Sweden, why am I even doing this? Transit, transit costs. Sweden case. Yeah, go here uh, if you want to see more me standing about Swedish planning, but also criticizing Swedish uh, um, procurement changes. Now, um, yeah, exactly. Infrastructure is designed to meet goals. Um, and this is where I think, so, so I've said so many times, not the last week's video, but in previous week's video, the difference, what the difference between planning and cramming is, and even alluded to it when I spoke favorably of Andrew Lynch, who transitioned from crowning to planning. He started by crowning future New York City subway extensions, and as an iterative process of arguing this with a lot of other rail fans, myself included, I was not, I was not, the, I was far from the most important among them. He, and again, with maybe a different network of people to argue with, which in my case includes him, I as well, figured out iteratively what some good plans are for subway expansion in New York. And I have videos about this. I have blog posts about this. I'm not going to repeat them. But the idea is that you look at the market. You look at the travel market. So maybe you're looking at Southeast Brooklyn and seeing what its travel needs are. And then from looking at these, you conclude that, yes, it's actually good to extend the subway underneath uh, No Strand and then build a Utica line. Um, and this was not done with IBX, making IBX kind of weirdly crayon -y, um, even though it's official crayon, but it's still crayon more than plan because they did not, I think, or, or if they did, it's not available to the public, which is sad because it's really interesting and would be useful for members of the public to look at, um, to, to look at maybe the reasoning why they didn't look at um, the LM option or why, they didn't look, um, or why they didn't look at the version that entered the wrong, as I said. Um, Early commitment does not need to, in the case of the Netherlands, they overbuilt. 
but it can also mean, mean underbuilding. It can also mean uh, electing not to do a certain extension uh, to essentially define the project too small, which was done, which is done a little bit in Europe when they don't define the high-speed rail project as a pan-European network. Um, but the but that's beside the point. The early commitment can go either way, um, and they're committing to it politically and early. Um, they're not looking at the uh, at why it's useful to run on this. There are very good reasons for this, but. Um, for example, you can see this with a very high ridership on these parallel buses, B35, B6, B82, um, to a lesser extent, B9, B11, B12, B3, B1. And so the, um, and understanding that, um, that tells you that this is a really strong core se um, section. Um, this is something very different. This is, um, this, Again, I don't want to make this like phase 1A and phase 1B and then this would never happen. This is also very good. And I'm not saying that the line should be cut into two. There's very good reasons to make it a continuous orbital. But again, study this way. Tell me why. Um, it's not just to inform the public, although informing the public is very important. Transparency is really good. Transparency is like journalists and academics who study these issues and the more technically literate and reasonable citizen advocates are an important part of the state for this. It, it, it's an important set of eyes for looking at the viability of plans. This is one of the superior things about democracy. Um, if you don't have this, if you, for example, throw journalists out of windows, then you're going to have, a, then let's say you're trying to, uh, let's say you have an irredentist claim on two countries to your southwest, one very small one that is run by someone who um, acts in many ways as your vassal, but one much larger one that is run by independent people who hate your breathing guts and are defining themselves in opposition to you. And you're so isolated from anyone who would tell you what your problems are that you think that you can invade them in three days and they would welcome you as liberators. And then you would think that maybe your military can just defeat them military um, can just defeat them and then NATO will not defend them and then you can do a general draft and that the draft would work and these are not going to be poorly trained conscripts so you can't get to the front. This is a this is why this is why transparency makes things better. Um and this is where the lack of transparency and in America it is as I said, some of it is not bad New York or bad Hokal, all of it is bad America. So the Obsession with mode is bad America. The lack of transparency is bad America as well. Um, Americans keep thinking that they are a more democratic country than non-English speaking democracies, especially because um, we don't have juries or something, or we have things that are approximations of juries that the lay judges, which honestly are bad and should be replaced by bad trials. But um, like, there's kind of notion that there's no real, there's no freedom in France or Germany. Um, which is daft, um, and in reality, there's much better transparency here than in the Anglosphere. The US and the UK, two different ways, um, are very opaque about what the government does. They will make it a hostile environment for you to figure things out. You need to submit a freedom of information request, as opposed to things already being available. Um, itemized costs in New York are trade secret. In Italy, they're public. Um, now, we don't think of, usually, of Italy usually as a transparent place, but when it comes to infrastructure, it's way better than Northern Europe, let alone anything that speaks English. Is there, I should say anything that speaks English natively because I live in Northern Europe. I got to tell you, people here speak English. Um, and, um, and so part of it is lack of transparency. That means that they don't plan. And in America, they think that instead it's about satisfying the unreasonable citizen advocates, so of the NIMBYs. So instead of transparency, you have these um, very legalistically written documents that are unreadable if you're not a lawyer and um, reveal very little and even then slide in assumptions. For example, the uh, Cuomo signature piece, the LaGuardia air train, um, had these internally long docs that essentially hand wave the biggest question about what alignment to take because Cuomo made a decision about a bad alignment. Thankfully, uh, Cuomo was gone. The LGA air, tra air train was canceled shortly after Hochul assumed office because everyone, literally everyone among the um, 
stated was not enthralled to come to Cuomo was against it. The planners, all the transit activists. Oh, Sunny, really good question. IDX to LGA. Um, this is an option. It should be studied. I think the answer is no, don't do it. And I want to explain why you shouldn't do it. Um, so yes, you can do it. The alignment will probably go like this. I mean, think. I mean, just look at the line. Um, from the purpose, from the, from the purpose of sharing tracks with freight, this entire section from um, uh, north of Fresh Ponds to the connection to Hellgate is one. So it doesn't matter when you um, branch off. So you can go here, branch off in the median of not the median alongside the freeway, which would require disturbing the graves. Um, and then go to LGA. It is perfectly viable. I don't think it should be done. And again, it should be studied, but it should be studied as, again, maybe studied it as a, maybe mentioned that it is, I would, to, to plan these separately, I would really, I'm sorry, I would probably mention that as a possible expansion um, in the IBX planning doc, and then I would study this as um, an LGA um, extension, or, sorry, where the options would be, you, again, you wouldn't study different alignments, which was done in the coma, or it was just done in a purely perfunctory matter. The decision had already been made in the public design docs, which are very long, were essentially designed as a rhetorical justification. Um, it's, it's, the, it's kind of the thing in Yes Minister, where the, where the minister asks to be informed on more things with the civil service, sends in every single uh, purchase that the department does, including stationary acquisition. It's, like, it's burying people in, in irrelevant trash. Um, it's when you tell someone who hates transparency that they need to be transparent, as opposed to just removing them. Um, so anyway, th there are a bunch of LaGuardia um, air train options. Uh, they're being studied. I think the one that is best is subway like this. Um, and the reason is that airport travelers are very Manhattan focused um, in general. Um, globally, airport travelers are very city center focused. Um, so if you want to be useful to people who are flying, you need to connect with city center efficiently. The storyline provides that it's a very fast connection um, if, if it's built this way. Uh, and if you do it as an IBX, it's not. It's going to be slower. It's also going to require a transfer, which is always dicey for tourists, but even to some extent to city residents have luggage. Um, the transfer penalty does get real when you do that. Um, and tourists are less familiar with the city. People who are less familiar with the city are less likely to want to transfer. And um, let me get to the point of the JFK was that on the air train station on um, that terminal. And there were trains that could go either to Howard Beach or uh, Jamaica. And a tourist asked, and, and maybe they seemed informed, and tourists asked me for directions, and, they, and the tourists told me that uh, I think they were going to Columbus Circle. The, the, their hotel was near Columbus Circle, so I said, okay. Um, and they asked me about Howard Beach. I said, yes, um, you can take the A. It will you can you can take the train to Howard Beach and then go to the A. It will take you all the way to Columbus Circle. But you should know that it is um, a very long trip, and a much faster trip would be to take a train to Jamaica, and then you take the E, and from the E you transfer to the B or D trains. They said at the Seventh Avenue to Colum one stop to Columbus Circle, and the tourist said, "I don't want to transfer," and got on the train to Howard Beach. Um, so, peculiarities of airport planning essentially make this less viable than people think. Uh, and no, it is more useful for airport workers. Airport workers are insufficient as a group to justify the line. You need the travelers, not just the workers. And all, I mean, the workers, many of them do live here, and it's really useful. Um, useful enough that um, this will get non derisors not enough to justify construction. But also, if this is built, and this is built, like on Hellgate, this is gonna be a very valuable connection um, for the airport worker. Um, so, at any rate, the issue is that the decision, the, the decision is very political, which means it's proceeding at, the, at least early, but it also means that a lot of people are bogging this down in the end. If you, and, and, and I'm pretty sure if you ask people to move this building, they'll say, no, no, it'll disturb our graveyard. It's like uh, it, it, it's like apartheid all over again or something. Um, whatever bullshit that people get to um, say when they know that the government is not going to just tell them, you're a bunch of assholes. We're not going to listen to a single thing you say. We are the state, you're not. 
things that, by the way, the government absolutely can tell them. And I mean, these are very petty NBs, um, but the government won't tell them. So when people know they can be unreasonable, they're going to be unreasonable. And um, so it's just a planning issue. The other issue I said before, there's a development angle. Um, the development angle is that, at least in public, they haven't talked about DOD. Um, this is bad because there is single family zoning within walking distance of uh, IBX. I'm going to check this because this was single family zoning IBX New York. Uh, yeah, so let me just. So the easiest way for me to be is to just find the tweets by Eric and Elif. This is something that I was much less involved in, the TOD angle on IBX. As I said, I do this for a living, but my role in IBX is somewhat different. This is mostly um, Eric and Elif doing the um, doing the design of the TOD. Um, Okay, so this is also good planning about um, planning to talk about who would be using this, and yeah, and you can see, um, you can and you can see, yeah, the sort of, um, and, and you can see the sort of, oh, right here. Okay, this is what I was looking for. Exactly. Thanks, Eric. Um, literally, a third of the land use within the IBX area is single family much more than multifamily. Um, so the, and there was a map that I saw, yeah. Um, this is the map with, with trip destinations. There was a map that I know that I saw while this was being planned. I mean, I'm not, I'm not on the, by, I don't have a byline on this, um, but I was, again, peripherally involved in this. I did look at the, um, I, I did look at this um, and I did see the map. There's things like, I don't remember if there's R1 or things like R3 type zoning within uh, um, within um, parts of this region. Again, just don't remember where they are. I was relying on the map and I cannot find it. Uh, does Eric have the map here? Okay, so this is uh, so this is not quite that, but close enough. Um, so. This is what you want to Google if you want to find this or just grab this link. Um, this is wherever the floor area ratio. So it's not quite single family because single family is usually a floor area ratio of up to one half, uh, something even less. And you can do a floor area ratio of one that's Almost that, that, that's already attached. That, um, that, that's like maybe attached single story, or even attached two stories with, or maybe duplex zoning. Um, but things that are very close to single family, missing middle would be about 1.25. One point. I think the upper limit of missing middle housing is 1.5, and then two. Um, North uh, traditional North that it is too, and traditional North that is somewhat is too dense, I think, to be called missing metal. Um, so maybe the mid rise range is two to four. Um, European cities tend to be about three, three and a half. Four Paris has sections that are four. Um, so IBX is here and here, and you can see there's single family zoning here. Um, less so here, but maybe again here, and this is going to be a junction in Brooklyn College. A lot of here, um, um, not Jackson Heights, of course, because that is that, that developed very early based on the seven train. You can kind of see how the seven pushes everything out, um, and the by smaller radius Queens Boulevard. The zoning limits do respect how the city looked in the 1950s. Um, in very few places did they down zone to the point of making existing development non-compliant. I think they did it in uh, in the village. Um, they downzoned it to less dense than it actually was, um, which with, with the enthusiastic support of Jane Jacobs, um, this is the, the city's most famous NIMBY. Um, but as soon as you step out of this early TOD development zone, like you know, 1920s and onward TOD, um, 
so this is so first of all you say this is brain drain kind of say this is, this is a breaking thing but there's also but also this part the transportation facility yeah there's lots of single family zoning or again things like two family zoning that is that is also not dense enough for new york um so this is also something that doesn't integrate with development very well and this is this is not an early commitment problem, okay? The lack of development integration is not early commitment because you can at any point choose to do TOD um, in the same way that um, Belgium can choose to build fast trains um, and then it would, you know, and then they would agglomerate to fast trains from Paris to the Netherlands. Um, trains that I must add are already not that slow because Paris to Brussels is very fast. Um, and yeah, Brussels to Antwerp it's slow, but I mean, Brussels to Rotterdam, the average speed there is not horrific. I mean, it's, I mean, it's the average speed of a line in Germany that doesn't have a lot of high-speed rail, and it's the it's the high speed. I think the average speed between Brussels and Rotterdam might be northeast corridor, and then maybe Brussels to would be high end northeast corridor, or like New York DC or something. Um, be even a bit faster. So, yeah, exactly. New York needs to build a lot of housing, but this is. Two separate things. So New York needs more housing, but New York needs more TOD. And IPX gives you a lot of the more TOD part. It also builds, gives you the more housing because it's more area that can be TODified. But separately, there are a lot of places that need TOD, regardless of what happens with IPX. Um, Brownstone, Brooklyn is probably the biggest um, offender in this. And the place that has the lowest density relative to what it could support. The village, like, like the the quote unquote valley, so not Manhattan Valley, the neighborhood, the one that's um, um, kind of the liminal, still working class area. I mean, not really, but the area with projects and everyone else there is a Columbia student. So this area in between, and the liminal zone between um, Morningside Heights middle class and Upper West Side middle class, um, the Upper West Side having countrified south to north. So in this zone, yeah, it's called Manhattan Valley, but what I mean, the actual, like, the, the kind of valley of the, not the, not the geographic valley, but the um, building top valley between skyscrapers, skyscrapers. So this entire zone is very underdeveloped because of that. Um, so, yeah, you would need to, and th this is independent of the new subways because this, uh, there's, this already has so much subway service. And it's not very busy because the trains are really crowded entering midtown from the north mainly and from Queens. And then past Midtown, they're not very crowded. Build more stuff here. This is reverse. This is effectively reverse peak, and, and toward uh, and it's reverse peak in both directions, really. Because so, in this direction, it's reverse peak because most of the ridership is to Midtown. In this direction, it's peak, but it's peak on the less busy side. In, in general, in New York, the busiest lines enter from points north and uh, east from, from Queens, um, and are much less busy entering from Brooklyn, with the exception of the L train. Um, and up zoning here is not going to uh, residential up zoning here is not going to overall the L train. Um, so the um, so that's probably so this and as I said because the lines in Brooklyn are undercrowded, this are probably the massive stuff that needs to be a lot taller than it is and make a lot more NIMBYs sad than are being made sad. But separately, this is a good place for TOD. Um, it's especially good. And remember how I talked about shaping versus serving? Uh, yeah, they, yes, the village has height restrictions. Yes, I support height restrictions in the village. I don't think they should be building residential buildings in the village older than 150 meters. Um, it's kind of overkill to do more than about 40 floors. Um, yeah, the fact that the village was industrial doesn't matter. I mean, the Lower East Side was also industrial and they've built it more. It's just that the village had NIMBYs like Jane Jacobs because it needed industrialists earlier. Um, so the, the over here, remember how I talked about shaping in the sense that they believe that Jackson Heights can grow as a destination, um, with the ethnic center of Indian New York as the anchor and same as Flushing is for Chinese New York, um, and Harlem for Black New York. Um, so in the same sense, it can grow. And then if there's more commercial development here, uh, it would encourage residential in areas that are within easy commute range. Well, I've got to tell you, here we have low density buildings. This is not, not that this is not single family zoning, 
these are attached row houses. Usually when people say single family zoning, they don't literally mean a building has one family in it, which I imagine is the case for many of these buildings. I don't know how many, but um, uh, how, how many split in the, um, are split and how many are not, but many of these would be split in single family, but again, it's attached um, and multi-story. And multi Usually when you say single family zoning, you mean, you mean detached single family that's normally single story. And if it's a duplex or more, it's because you're filthy rich, not because you have, uh, like, like, look at this building, right? I mean, I'm just gonna randomly take the corner building here. Um, let's try to count. Um, let's try to count. It's, it looks like a two story, it's not really a duplex. So it is 15 meters and it's elongated 15 meters. So it's 15 meters by eight. And I'm pretty sure it's less than eight, more like six or seven or something. So this looks like a hundred and a bit square meters per floor, um, which is either two medium sized apartments or one large unit. And probably with its internal stairs and such, it's in practice less than 200. Um, yeah, that could be either way. Um, and usually, so usually it's, uh, it, it, when people think single family, I mean, it's something that the size of that, but it's a single story, um, detached. Um, and if it's a duplex, it's because you're incredible, again, you're incredibly rich, you have more than the, um, average size of a new American house, which is 200 meters, which is just about 200 square meters. Um, and so, yeah, so this would be a very good space for mid-rise TOD. People would come in. Um, and, um, it would be also be anchored by, um, commutes on the M, uh, from here, from Middle Village. Uh, people will be able to commute here and either connect to Lower Manhattan or just go to Midtown. Maybe if there's the underlining, we'll go direct to Lower Manhattan, but let's not, let's put the interlining aside for a second. And so the, um, so, so these are really good spots for, Upzoning, but again, th this is not being pursued right now, um, and I think it should be, um, essentially because you want to have the NIMBY conflict early rather than late. Essentially, you want to have the NIMBY conflict when the governor's heft exists. Um, but this is not an early commitment problem. Quite to the contrary, this is the thing where early commitment is useful, and yet they are not. You, um, for early commitment, sorry, where it's, which is generally really bad, this is one thing you can use to make early commitment work for you, and it is unfortunately not being done. Um, yeah, yeah, um, five-story units would have a ton of housing, as I said, mid-rise. Um, when I say mid-rise, I mean, I think of a Europe, I think of it as European mid-rise, so five to nine stories. Um, in New York, there's actually a lot of vernacular 10-story stuff. Maybe not anymore. I think the construction techniques are such that you build six, maybe seven stories where you build 15 plus, and if you, and, and the uncanny value between about eight and 14 is cost ineffective because you use techniques for 15, but you don't, but you have high fixed costs and you essentially only do that if you have height limits as in Washington, DC. In Europe, the, the construction techniques are different. Buildings are never built of wood. Maybe they are in Finland, they aren't in Germany or in France. Um, so the construction costs are much more linear in height. Um, and yeah, we have seven, eight, sorry. Um, that's what I think of as mid-rise. High-rise is 15, 20, 30. We lack that because Euroland is great, but there are certain things about Euroland that are not very great. This is one of the things that are not very great. Um, now, I've spent most of the last two hours slagging on early commitment, poor planning, and what it leads to with the engineering, the, a lot of stuff that is easier than they think is not being done. Um, the which I mean, very short tunnel that saves you a lot of time for very little money. Um, as I said, I've slagged a lot. This is a good project. It, as I said, I, I worry that they might be incompetent enough to actually pull off making it cost ineffective, but it requires extraordinary effort to make it cost ineffective. Um, like, we're talking... The, Think about it, the, what's the length of the line? Okay, I mean, it's, what, well, it is, start here. I mean, I'm sure it's written somewhere, but it's going to be easier for me to, if I'm on Google, 
just measure the entire thing approximately than to uh, than to see which of my many browser tabs does that. And you notice that it's not perfectly accurate, it doesn't matter. Okay, this is 23 kilometers, maybe 24. Um, doing it in $5 billion is basically a greenfield cut and cover subway. Or not even cut and cover, cut and cover subway would be cheaper. A greenfield subway built by TBM outside city center without um, too much difficulty with geology, which this area does not have um, difficulties. The difficulties are farther southeast um, for a full subway not for something in existence right away, and I worry that they will get that. Again, I worry. But, um, so anyway, I'm going to take questions. Okay, um, you're wondering how light rail won't have too much cost because of separation requirements. Okay, um, I dislike the expression FRA separation requirements because it's a baboon rule. Um, everyone assumes the FRA are much more baboonish than they actually are. The FRA is the FRA turned out to be a lot more reasonable. I mean, they're reasonable in a way that still gives them the latitude to say no, um, which is why the um, uh, rolling stock procurement, not rolling, the rolling stock regulation reform does not say if it's legal in Europe, it's legal in America. This actually says if it's legal in Europe, you can you can ask us and we will and we will say yes to you. Um, so a lot of people get skittish, which is why they're not buying equipment compliant with the new rules in the New York area, only with the old rules. Um, but the FRA has shown itself to be pretty reasonable about these things. Um, if you have separate rights of way, it is going to be, I think, okay. Um, you, you need to talk technically to them, but that's not hard. And, um, this is such a restricted right of way that you're not even going to be able to say, well, any train can get there. No, not any train can get there. Like very specific kinds of freight trains are there. Um, like the FRA, I don't think the FRA is a big um, malefactor in the um, in, in cost blowouts in this. Um, I, I know that it wasn't the Acela and everyone got bad taste over this, but the people who made that decision have been have all retired. That decision was is from twenty five years ago. They're all retired. Current FRA, just judging by the reforms that they've done, is trying to make sure that doesn't happen again. It's, by the way, speaking of, 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 of the kind of hang-ups from 25 years ago, the reason for the bad Cuomo air train um, is that a good air train alignment had been planned in the 90s. Giuliani, uh, Mayor Giuliani wanted it. It was this, I believe it was this alignment. And uh, NIMPYs fought it because Astoria and NIMPYs did not want more elevated trains. And this is why Cuomo decided to build an air train as far away from residents as possible, leading to building an air train from LaGuardia to met to Willis Point, so that all the people who are going to Manhattan, which is again most airport travelers, um, and also most of the workers, the workers mostly work here, not here, would have to go limp and back. It was boomers thinking that the boomers in the story were still in charge, where in practice all of the NIMBYs, you're all of the 1990s NIMBYs here, are dead or in Florida. Astoria has changed in the last 25 years. The Astoria of today is an Astoria where most people um, are not old-timey neighborhood people, but people who live here to work in Manhattan, and maybe many of them are... So it, it, I don't want to say gentrified. The neighborhood was not poor in the last few generations. It's essentially gentrified from middle class with a lot of white ethnic markers. Again, the, the kind of... Room, remember how I said that um, the people who anchor a neighborhood, an ethnic neighborhood center have to be relatively well off to own their own, to own businesses, but, um, and that requires some level of social integration into the, the because this is an Asian, these are Asian examples would be white majority and then historically Greek majority would be white majority. Um, but, um, the, but, um, they have also have to have a lot, um, very tight connections to the community to be business leaders to the community rather than let's say the more typical chinese um, middle class chinese new yorker let's say a doctor or a professor or an engineer who just moves to a jersey or westchester um suburb for the school and um lives 
among the white people and maybe dates uh, and, and maybe will date white people. Um, and so the kind of well of Greek Americans with the Greek American ID poll who owned businesses, um, the ones who stay, these, these tend to be the last ones to leave a neighborhood as there's um, social and um, uh, ethnic assimilation into the majority. Um, so they complain about gentrification. Maybe they are generally anti-gentrification is not the cry of the poor. It's the cry of the local. That is the local notables. So it's the local notables um, who don't care about any of this. And they, um, the last remnant, so there was kind of gentrification from one kind of middle class to another kind of middle class, probably about equally wealthy. But um, instead of ethnically rooted business owners whose ethnic community has already assimilated um, and essentially moved to the suburbs, which is where lost Americans were supposed to be living in the middle of the 20th century. Um, instead of that, it's people who work in the city. Um, I mean, people who work in city center. Um, many of them are domestic migrants. Um, there, there's not a lot of domestic migration into New York, um, but there is some, and it tends to be very high income. Um, because these kinds of people are in, often in Astoria. Yeah, these people like being able to fly to their parents in Indiana from LaGuardia. Um, in the same way, um, I think the FRA thing is people overrating decisions made by people who not only have all retired or died, but that the current institution, not explicitly, but practically defines itself against. Yeah, the Will's point is obnoxious, and um, Cuomo, a good, a good rule of thumb is that any decision made by Cuomo is bad. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, when you also intersect with a really bad politician like Cuomo, yeah, you get that. Now, Hochul is not a really bad politician. I view Hochul as a replacement level generic Democrat. I mean, she randomly became governor. She's a piece of paper that has D written on it, which is better than any very charismatic or, or high personality kind of Democrat in New York, which would always inject their own pettiness to it. I don't think Hochul is a petty actor. I think Hochul is doing this. He had to build clout, but it's building clout with a genuinely good project, a project, uh, a, a genuinely good project that is being misplanned and might be misplanned to the point of cost and effectiveness, but even that requires unusual incompetence, and they, and they may have that unusual incompetence, but they might not. They might, they might still be able to do it cost-effectively. Um, oh, not sure it's um, hard to reach and have a call with FRA. It's not hard. They just don't do it because they don't like coordinating with other people. Um, like The idea of actually forming these relationships is difficult for them because, again, it's a baboon role. Every agency assumes all other agencies are baboons. Um, and try to minimize interaction with, uh, interactions with them. Um, are there other questions? Because I've been, I've been doing this two and a half hours, so. Yeah. No, it's not do, do what Caltrain did. It, did. it did something much easier than what Caltrain did. What Caltrain did was before the new rules passed. This is after the new rules have passed. Um, I mean, this is, I mean, if the MPTA is starting to do it, it's just doing it wrong because they have no in-house expertise and the person they hired knows a lot of things, but I think mis like, like underrates the extent to which everything that the locals tell him is garbage. Um, yeah, it, it's all this. Is, yeah, I don't know why they're not looking at it again. I'm assuming that they think it's too hard or that they haven't thought about it very much. One of the problems with rushing this is that they never did proper design. Um, think about who would they have done? Who would the design have been? I mean, the usual consultants the usual, who do the usual, it's an American ecosystem, they're not very good at this. Um, or maybe the junior workers are, but the managers don't listen to them. In-house, they're so ignorant of what regional rail is that um, not um, Jano Lieber, the current head, but the previous head of the MTA, Pat Foy, said with the perfect confidence of someone who believed it, that actually... Um, at the time, London had a congestion, built congestion pricing. It did not have commu like a commuter rail system as extensive as New York's. 
this is complete garbage. What he means is that the overground was under development, but most of the commuter rail in London is not the overground. It's just the overground is the one, is the one brand that Americans have heard of. Um, and so the RPA says, do like the London overground or, thing, or something like that and not, hey, you see how the um, commuter of London is set up? Yeah, there's the overground for certain things. And for other things, there are these very extensive and extensively used lines all over the city, especially in South London and East London, where the um, underground network is sparser. And look at the investments that they're doing there because they just don't know. Um, a lot of it is American slash New York ignorance. Yes, London commuter rail's problem is too many people use it. This is not... Uh, London does not have the commuter rail system that New York does. Thank you very much. Is, London has such a vast system and such, and that it fills too much, and they um, are very slowly, due to very high construction costs, too slowly, um, decongesting it by building um, extra connections, like cross rail, like the cancelled to paused cross rail to things like that. Um, we're also doing a lot of deinterlining in London, uh, just happening very slowly because there's always extra infrastructure that needs to be built around. And again, London costs are very high. Um, I should ask more if there are questions, and we'll try to stop this at 10, um, which will be or before 10. 10 is going to be 2 hours 45. Um, session here is from when I started streaming, but it actually should be from when I started recording. I'm going to give it another minute at least, just because I know people time and I have lag. I mean, I shouldn't say I have lag. Twitch uh, has lag. Twitch is not perfectly synchronized. I mean, there's always a little bit of lag. Oh, thanks, Rob. It's really sad because ABX is good. ABX is so it's such a good idea that it can be mismanaged and still um, be better than nothing. Uh, yeah, I can see a level of incompetence that makes it worse than nothing. But it's but I can only but I need to squint my eyes to say it. I mean, the poor planning they're doing is leaving a lot of value on the table, but it might still be. Better than nothing, even with even if you bake in some assumptions on cost overrun. Um, ooh, um, yeah, good. Uh, I guess you're in New York, a really good late afternoon to you too. Um, so um, I do not know what my topic is going to be for. Yeah, it's not just the MTA. And yeah, the MTA is, is, is the worst in America, but America, but it's often, much of it is a pan US problem. Um, and I suspect, I mean, by the way, with the maintenance productivity, I suspect um, part of it is um, um, part of it is not pure in New York. I think the maintenance productivity is also bad in Boston. They just don't know how to use the nighttime windows efficiently. Yeah, it would be a fun topic, but this is not what I'm an expert in. This is something that I know three things about. The actual expert is Uday. Um, so um, he is uh, going to... So he is a senior um, in college, and I don't know what he's planning to do after graduating. I'm forgetting whether he's planning to go. Yeah, I, Uday, uh, Uday is stuff like this. Um, it's not Uday, it's Uday. Um, um, so, because it's like, it's a... It's an Indian name um, that comes from the Arab name, which is originally Uday. Uh, and it's spelled, it's, it might actually be pronounced Uday um, in Hindi, but it's spelled A1. Um, anyway, yeah, I mean, you can drag him on stream if I see him in person, which I expect I will. And uh, I can 
uh, or I can just ask him to work for this. No, no, it's not a Hebrew name. He's not Jewish. Um, he, he's um, biracial, but on his right side, the one, the one that produces the last name Schultz. Um, I assume that it was Schultz is in German Jewish Schultz. No, it's um, German, not Jewish Schultz. Um, and, um, but yeah, um, this is something that he knows a fuck ton about. Um, he's also a lot less, less jaded than me, which, I mean, Uday and Shaul are both much more respectful of current New York City institutions, which I used to be, and maybe because I study construction costs and I study commuter rail, which are literally the worst, much worse than maintenance of the subway, much worse than operations on the subway. Um, that's where, that's where my burn it all down fire them all mentality comes from a mentality that again Uday does not have and and yes I'm older than him and I'm more jaded that's not where he does it it's not, it's not like youthful idealism it's specifically he studies something where the MTA has is has some good ideas that are being not implemented well as opposed to something where you need to hit the reset button uh but yes I wish I knew more about this um, I think it's very important. It intersects with operations very intimately because the maintenance issues are blocking the ability of the MTA or of the subway of New City Transit to run good off-peak frequency even on weekdays at this point, not just weekends. Um, but again, it's something that essentially we're all looking for him to do this in the same way that, like, when I had nine thousand followers on Twitter in twenty. 12, 2013, there were a bunch of people waiting for me to um, do something, or me or someone else to do something more extensive about construction costs, which others sadly didn't, and then I did years later post leaving academia. You know, I know, I know. The um, I, I know the maintenance practices are terrible. Um, the maintenance practices are especially terrible on commuter rail, um, but there was also problems on the subway, and again, I don't want to talk more about this because I... I can tell you some things about bad maintenance on Canary. I can tell you fewer things about maintenance on bad maintenance in New York on the subway. Um, again, especially for subway-related issues, there exists a an expert on this on transit Twitter who is not me. Um, and I don't want to put words in his mouth. Um, but anyway, um, unless there are more questions, I do want to end this. Um, I, I, again, I don't want to go into talk about everyone's better at this. Um, I, I do want to, as I said, um, I, I, I don't want to come back to some, um, to this sometime later, but it's certainly not going to be next week's stream. I do not know what next week's stream is going to be. Yeah, yeah, we can always talk on Discord. He is on Discord. He's not very active there, but he is a member. Um, but anyway, um, I do want to stop the to, um, to stop right now, as I said, um, and I will see you next week with another video on a different topic. As I said, TBD. I will attempt to make it not a New York topic in respect to Porner and his "Why do I always talk about New York?" question. Um, so until then, um, oh yes, and Andrew, and of course Andrew Lynch. Wait. We'll meet soon, I can imagine. So, thanks, Prague. Thanks, Ani. Thanks, everyone else. And Dr. Ari will see you in a week.